Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. Our guest today is Natasha Petrovic. Natasha, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. So we first, before we get started, I'm going to have to chastise Natasha a little bit. <laughs> so usually what happens on these podcasts, people see me in their bios. I, take, I use a bio the social media, like do talking points, right? So Natasha really busy, couldn't do it, right? So this is going to be straight off the cuff, no talking points. So you don't have right to... Here. <laughs> we're not, we're not, we're not, I, we're not, so we just have to have the buyer have the talking points. I ask a question and my mind goes rapid fire and whatever question ends is what I ask, right? So this is going to be totally off the cuff. I love it. Let's do it. So what, what do you do for fun? Ah, uh, travel is probably my number one. Um, if I can get somewhere on a beach, that's definitely top of the list. Um, do love to do tons of snorkeling. Actually going to be going on a trip soon. And my guy and I got some underwater scooters. So it's like the little James Bond thing. And you just scoot around five miles per hour underneath. You don't have to. So you're like on the ocean floor with a scooter? You can. It's. I mean, as long as you can. I mean, we're snorkeling. So as long as you can hold your breath, okay, you can go. But because you're not exerting any force, you know, you just hold on to it. You're not pedaling. It sounds like that's scientifically impossible. Like how, like, I mean, how does that even work? Like is it battery power, like gas? Or like... It's battery powered. It's electric. The water it's... doesn't fuck with it or not? No. And you charge it USB. Okay. So it's not, it's, it's like five pounds. It's like this large. And you just hold on to it and it pulls. And actually there's a contraption where you can attach two and at even higher speeds. It lasts about 45 minutes. So it's not an incredibly long time. Okay. But well, it's definitely a cool factor thing to do. Yeah, I'm guilty. <laughs> <laughs> and how long have y'all been snorkeling? Uh, full time. Like now, every time we go on vacation, we're really focusing on trying to find new places to go. Uh, so I probably say only a year and a half when we discovered those scooters. Okay. Um, I have some ear canal issues, so yeah. I have to get that checked out before I can go scuba. So this is probably the best, okay. you know, second best way to do something under the water without me having to... Um, you'll get certifications or have to go way low. So, mm -hmm. so I know scuba dive, you have to get certified, right? Yes. yes. Snorkeling, you just jump in the water and do whatever. Yep, you put your goggles on, put your little snorkel in. Honestly, half the time I go under, you, you just hold your breath. And then when you come out, shoot out your snorkel. Okay. And you can see up on the top. But that's where the turtles kind of hang out. Yeah. Stingrays. Um, you know, a lot of good little fish or anything hiding in the. And that's what y'all did in San Diego you just came from? Uh, that was actually a trade show. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so, so it was business. Okay. That was business. Okay. Uh, next week, though, is Costa Rica. Oh, wow. And we're going to check out on that side. Um, there's going to hopefully be some flamingos this time of year. Um, we'll see. I'm not sure yet. I've never been. Our Belize is like a great place for snorkeling, that kind of stuff. I've heard great things. Yeah. I kind of stay more on the Caribbean side. Okay. But hopefully expand it. Definitely. That'd be great. So is this like an expensive hobby to do? No, because once you buy the contraption yeah that's it yeah i think it's the best way to save money because no matter what you're going to have it and i'm guessing you have to you you can't really can't go snorkeling off the coast of washington or alaska right you have to do like warm warm city i mean places. if you're brave and you have a wetsuit you could <laughs> um well, the water's pretty dark here though right yeah and cold it's just yeah not, not i don't know if it's worth it maybe maybe there's some people that do it and they're great at it maybe they you could go get some crab down there uh -huh. you know i'm not sure that's actually so what's the craziest like creature or thing you've seen while snorkeling? Um, well, I'd say the stingray was probably the coolest because it did just kind of pop out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, um, however, I had gone to the Grand Caymans and they have a ton of lobster. Okay. And the water is 90 degrees. And so you got these little lobsters like just kind of popping out of <laughs> their little holes, but they're, I don't know, 10, 10 pounds, five to 10 pounds in these. So they have a um, lobster season. Okay. And I think it's almost starting now. But um, when I went back a few months ago, they were still little little babies. Okay. But there's tons of them, and you can't touch them. But they're right they're right there on the on the floor. If you wanted to give them a little pet, you could. <laughs> but I definitely wouldn't do that for anything. <laughs> yeah. So what's like what's on your bucket list of places to go snorkeling? I think it's going to have to be the Great Barrier Reef. That's, oh, well, uh, that's in Australia. Yeah, and so. I mean, you, you can snorkel off of it, and and then that is if I can get that scuba, I would love to get a little deeper. Yeah. Is that yeah. hard to get? No, it's no. going to be a little more expensive, however. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the trick is to try to go to another country and do it a lot. Um, I've heard, like, Thailand's one of the greatest places to go and get your, uh, your scuba license, yeah. So you always been interested in the water? You know, I guess so. I never really realized it. I've always been a coaster. I've... Started, I mean, I, I grew up in Chicago, but 
that that big lake is so large. Yeah. I've even had visitors be like, what ocean's that? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, no, that's not the ocean. We're talking like people out of the country. Yeah. Come and they're like, are you sure that's not part of the ocean? <laughs> no. Um, so grew up right off there. I had a great aunt in Pismo Beach, California. So I'd go out there every summer as a kid and play on the beach there. And no matter where I am, I have to live on the water. water. So even here in Seattle, I'm look out the water every day. Just hello. Yeah, to me, like, you know, I don't care what your troubles are that day. If you just go listen to some waves on the lake or ocean, there's like all problems that seem like it just go away. Just so uh, therapeutic, so to speak, you know. Exactly. And when I come home, especially from like business trips, I actually feel more like I'm going on vacation when I'm home. In yeah. a sense, if that makes it makes a lot you know, of sense. Yeah. yeah. So you're born and raised in Chicago. Yes. <laughs> On the whole loop, I moved the whole round. So I've been to both baseball stadiums, basically, is where, <laughs> I, where I lived, uh -huh. and then Greek Town, a little bit on the north side, and then that's okay. then I ended up in Seattle. <laughs> okay. So Petrovich, what what ethnicity is that? It's Serbian and Russian. Okay. Um, basically means Peters. Okay. So yeah. have you ever been over there? No, no not yet. Oh, okay. I had one of my cousins from Kosovo come in, but uh, hopefully someday I get over on that side. Okay. Yeah. So I think most people, they think of Chicago, they think, of course, wind, the cold, the crime on the south side. But I'm sure you know, it's like more to Chicago than that, right? Can you talk about some of your experiences growing up in Chicago? I mean, food is really number one. It really is. You, <laughs> If you're going to go to Chicago, I mean, of course, like the pizza, the cheese, and all of our cheese seems to be coming from Wisconsin. Thanks, Wisconsin. <laughs> we call her squeaky cheese. Uh, the little nibbles of like white cheese and you eat them up and that's it. You don't do anything with it. Um, so yeah, the pizza's number one, I think. And you know, you have your hot dogs, but your main part is the meat packing district from way back in the day. That was the, the hub for the railroads, right? And so they know their steaks. So if you get a good steakhouse, get something real juicy, get a nice ribeye, um, highly recommend. And then go to the speakeasies. So when we talk on the drinking side, yes, you get all those little Al Capone coves, go through the alleys, find a good cocktail place. And you're never bored because every like couple storefronts or whatever is going to be a good restaurant or bar lounge. Um, and what's nice about nowadays is mocktails are getting larger in popularity. And so even if you're not a drinker, you're still going to have fun and they're still going to find ways for you to feel a part of all like the drinking scene that's down there. Now, like, I've been in some like cold places in my like in my army career, like Korea, Germany, Kansas, but Chicago mm -hmm. is up there as far as cold, right? Like that wind cuts you through, you, right? It's yes. like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's not no joke. <laughs> I don't miss the Chicago winters. Um, January, February, your your eyeballs freeze. Like you just you just you literally have to close your eyes sometimes. And technically, your little key fob on your car <laughs> says, "Don't start below." whatever is 20 degrees and you're like, you're like, nope, nope, not going to happen. I'm still going to do it. I'm it. Um, and the, you know, yeah, just going out, trying to warm up that car for 10 minutes. When I was in school, that was probably the hardest part is you're, you're defrosting everything. And you're like, I just want to go back in bed. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's rough. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the lake freezes. So okay. sometimes the waves will come up, the waves will come up and be frozen and the beautiful oh, like wow. icicles. I like, I like to see that. Yeah, yeah. And do people like go ice skating on the lake when they freeze it? Mm, it doesn't quite freeze that much. It's more of the edges. Okay. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of lakes to do that on and sledding. But you know, I don't know with all the like the weather changes. As a kid, I feel like I had more snow um, where you could play in it. Yeah. Where now I feel like when it does snow, it's like freezing. Just like the harder compact, and I'm yeah. sure a meteorologist could figure yeah, out what that is. But scientists or something. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not but, sure if anything's changed with that. The, yeah. the lake I used to skate on, definitely only like half the lake is available. Okay. A lot more winters I've noticed because I still go see my dad, and yeah. it's like right there when I. So you still have family there and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. How often you go back to Chicago to visit? Almost every other month. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. That's good. And it's usually cheap flights. Oh, yeah. Get yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Like people complain like. Flights expensive, like of course you get a flight today, it's gonna cost a lot of money. But if you do like some prior planning, like two months ahead of time, it's pretty reasonable, right? Exactly. No, I totally took advantage of the Black Friday deals, you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> and the thing, like, it kind of makes me makes some sense. Like, you seem like you know, if I don't get a flight today, and there's like ten seats available, I will get a cheap flight so I can fill a plane versus charging me 
all this money, right? You think? I, I don't know what their algorithms are yeah. anymore. I remember back in the day, you were told, well, if you wait the whole time and you go to the desk, they'll give you a really good deal. Yeah. And like, I don't remember hearing anything. Since yeah. Like and the they 90s. say, you know, if you like, you know, clear your cookies on your computer or use a different VPN, uh -huh. like do, do your VPN, like you're from like, I don't know, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, you got a cheaper deal or all this crazy stuff. Like, I, yeah. I don't have time to do that right. I know, right? And, you know, maybe you try going to one of those third parties to like at least search without yeah, affecting yeah. the prices. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You have a favorite airline you fly or you, or you just do whatever's cheapest? Um, I do prefer anything in the one world area just because when you do pick um, just a straight path, yeah, you're going to get all those benefits on whomever. What airlines are those? So I do prefer American Alaska, okay. their partners, uh, British Airways, Aer Lingus. I want to say Air Canada is part of it too, but um, yeah, I'm, I, I fly Alaska a lot. I'm a big fan of theirs. Yeah, yeah, everybody's I, amazing. Oh, so my daughter works at Southwest. So I used to try to fly to Southwest, but the prices are just fucking outrageous now. Yeah, and they used to have a direct flight from here to Dallas, but it's, they got rid of it. So like, I'm not paying ten thousand dollars, like, you know. Travel from here to Denver, wait six hours, and you know. No, and still fight for a seat. And I, yeah. I feel like I'm going on a, a, a bus. Like, hey, is this seat available? Yeah. Like, is this okay? And yeah. I'm a tall person. Yeah. I I need my aisle seat. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I, like, I, I just want to make sure. I, I, I like Alaska a lot. Yeah. And of course, I think my worst flying experience was um. This is a uh, well, it's funny now. It wasn't funny. It wasn't funny then. So I was stationed in the army in Fort Jack, South Carolina. My former boss was getting promoted to Fort Worth Colonel. So I was, I was going to fly from Columbia to Washington, D.C. to his promotion. Ooh. But I could only find a flight on Spirit. Yep. <laughs> and so I, I, I had no idea about Spirit. Right? I had no idea, right? I got a round trip ticket. I flew on Spirit. As soon as I landed, I got a flight back, another airline coming back. I said, I would never fly Spirit again. Like, I was fearful for my life. It was like, what in the fuck is going on, right? Like, how are you even allowed to fly by the FAA? This is incredible. I don't know. And it's them and there's a couple other airlines where you have to pay for your carry-on. Yeah. And, you know, nickel and dime, nickel and dime. And I believe, if I remember correctly, I heard that Frontier is getting yeah. bought out by someone. Yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah. And I'm curious how they're going to change that system or not. Mm -hmm. um, but as a customer, like, especially when you see... All the old videos from back in the day when they were carving turkeys on the plane. And I know, right? and out, You're like... And you get upgraded the first set a couple times, and you're like, this is how you're supposed to be treated as a customer. Yeah. And they're like, eh, just everybody shove everybody in the back now. Oh, 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 way back <laughs> in the day, they're you know, serving first class meals everywhere. Mm -hmm. They're like handing out cigarettes, lighting cigarettes. It's like, it's like running up and down the aisle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow, this is not supposed to be right. <laughs> now it's like, cram, uh, we're trying to cattle right. Yeah. But I always like, you know, always like get the economy plus or like mm -hmm. a small upgrade. I mean, those extra two three feet that makes so much a difference it really does or even just the recline too and i love how some uh companies even tell you like hey you're going on a 737 and there you have a four inch pitch et cetera, et cetera. you're gonna get you know what you're gonna get where there's some other companies you're like okay that's it this might be your plane that's all we got for you yeah <laughs> good luck you, everybody else can't tell you <laughs> yet you know yeah you might be in the front you might be in the back Yep. Hell, you might follow. You might, you might be flying the plane. Right. Oh. <laughs> now you get the toilet seat. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's blocky in. <laughs> You're in the jump seat. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, one of our stewardess called in sick. We need for you to pass out some napkins. Now I would pay off my ticket that way, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Put me to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so you go to Chicago every month. That's good. <laughs> so you just came from a trade show in San Diego. I did. Yes. How was that? It was excellent. Uh, it was a medical trade show. Um, so I've actually been working trade shows for over 20 years and between the bartending that I do now and the trade show work that I kind of am doing since post COVID it hasn't been quite the same business since pre COVID, but, um, I also do barista work. So I help the trade shows, uh, set all that out or do any other assistant work out there. So yeah, I did just come back. It was beautiful. 70 degrees and <laughs> came into what 45 now. <laughs> Which is, I know I sound like I'm whining from <laughs> Chicago. It's like, not 16 or 32, <laughs> but. Uh, so cold, so especially fun. the rain, the gray skies and stuff. Yeah. 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 And I, and I do love it here compared to at least I'm getting gray skies and rain than snow. And the snow's pretty. I love the snow. The Christmas time is great, but especially again, once January starts, it yeah. freezes, it gets dirty yeah. and there's 
just nothing fun about it. <laughs> it's not. It's not for these trade shows. You have to pay to go to trade shows. They're paying you. How's that? How's all that? Work? Oh, they're paying me as an a, like a booth assistant, basically. Okay. Yeah. So if you let's say if you ever go to an auto show, um, you do have some of the speakers. I have done that as well. I've done MC work where you go and go around the car. You tell everybody, hey, this is the Jaguar, etc., and this has the new assist parking, and then you just go around telling people, um, oh, hey, like we we, we partner with these. You know, let's say um, Ford, we have Ford and you have Jaguar. They're kind of like together. And you're like, oh, well, if you know, if you like this car, go check out uh, you know, the, our other brands. And they're very long days. <laughs> um, How many days was this trade show? The trade, uh, the trade show I just worked? Yeah. That one's only three days. Three days. Okay. Um, the medical shows and are it, usually it, pretty it, nice. it's like nine to five or something like that. Typically, if you're really lucky, you get like a 10 to three. Okay. Uh, you can get some very long ones, though, which can be eight in the morning to 6 p.m. And all they're like, I'm guessing there's like after parties you're supposed to go to yeah. or like networking events, you know, or like, you know, such and such booths hosting this get together, this place somewhere else. Right. And there's usually a sponsor or two that are, are going to be telling the whole uh, convention center, hey, come to our party because we want you to know about our brands a little more. Okay. Um, thankfully as a trade show, yeah, trade show hostess is sometimes, uh, or assistant, whatever, whatever niche you fall into, it, it's kind of interesting because there really is no exact, uh, job description. Okay. You really are a Jill or Jack of all trades when it comes to that. You jump, you just jump in, they give you your footnotes on the business and you're either trying to sell whatever they're selling, trying to collect contacts. And so this has nothing thing. to do nothing to do with your bartending business. Nope. <laughs> so how do you get this opportunity? You just don't know for a while and people reach out to you for it or uh, there are agencies that um you know hire for that. And so I'm still attached to those agencies or okay. the clients had worked with me for so long. And let's say those agencies did end, end up falling unfortunately because of COVID, they're still calling me directly. Um okay. and because a lot of times I am doing the barista work in those booths, it's very similar to bartending. What, what's barista work? Oh, coffee. Coffee. Yeah. Okay, coffee, coffee, coffee service. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right, okay. yeah. So we, we have the full espresso machines making everything from, you know, just little espresso shots to the specialty, uh, like co Coco Mocos okay. or whatever you're doing. Like the last one I was doing was just hazelnut <laughs> mochas. Yeah. Or chai lattes. <laughs> so these trade shows, what do you get out of this personally and professionally? Mostly professionally. However, it's kind of like a traveling circus. <laughs> All my best friends. I started off working trade shows with. And so what's really nice is like a family reunion. When you go to certain shows, you, you see everybody again, you even will call, Hey, are you working? Um, RSNA RSNA is, um, like a, a restaurant show in Chicago and it's one of the largest ones. And you come home with all these samples and everybody wants to work it because of that. <laughs> and you get to see everyone. So you're like, hey, you're working this show, you're working this show, and you, you try to find everybody and connect again. So that side on the personal side is great, but on the business side, you learn a heck of a lot. It doesn't matter what the trade show is, if it's about pets, if it's about beer, if it's about, the, you know, we've done colonoscopy shows. Like, like every, <laughs> I could tell you stories. Um, so you see everything and you just learn as an outsider, but you start to absorb it kind of as this interesting middleman. Uh, I, I know how almost every little step of getting uh, LASIK eye surgery now, because I've you just watch the videos while it's slow and you talk to everyone in the booth and you talk to other customers and clients. And it's just so intriguing on how every job you have is different. So your office is never boring. Yeah. And they pay you like by the hour, by the whole trade show. How's that work? It's usually a day rate. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they fly you out. They usually take care of your they, hotel they, and stuff. They pay the per diem, all kind of stuff. Most of them do. Yeah. Okay. So some smaller ones, they don't. They do look for local only. Um, and then sometimes you're like, okay, well, maybe I won't this time. Or if it's in a, a city where like one of my friends do live, then we do crash and, at their house and then we all okay. we'll, we'll go together. And how long have you been doing this? 20 years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did it straight out of high school. Man, you've oh, been yeah. awesome for a while. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So is this like a, oh, let's suppose you don't do your bartending. Do you make a living off doing this? I was, yeah. yeah unfortunately, until COVID. Okay. Um, and then since COVID, there's not as much person to person. Mm -hmm. You have to do Zoom, I think, changed it all really to uh, when they did try to get the trade shows back. If you look up on Google, the first CES, when, when they opened back up again, 
there were booths that were empty yeah. and just a couple little signs. People didn't even show up and it was very depressing and also boring because no one was there. So you couldn't talk to and, and they're 10 hour days. So when you're just twiddling your thumbs, that'd be boring. Yeah. yeah. And it's one of the most interesting trade shows you ever go to. Cause it's all the future tech mm -hmm. that's going to come out. I remember when the 4k curved screens were at CES, I was like, huge like this this like this whole wall is curved, curved yeah. yeah and i remember it's like oh forty thousand dollars is this tv <laughs> or whatever it was and you're like oh okay well <laughs> out of my I'm gonna price range looking, yeah out of my price range yeah, yeah that's like let me wait six seven years <laughs> till it goes on a four hundred dollar exactly some people make that as their year salary right yeah <laughs> and so what's the next trade show you're doing um not sure yet okay. uh typically this is kind of the last show of the year for the season there are a couple other shows but um auto shows do start up in about january february i kind of stepped away from that because it is more of a full-time gig where i do own my own business now and that's not something i can really do anymore so I, march is probably and like so uh, like this on, on average like how many like press or advice you get per month and then how how do you decide from those number of advice which one to go to how much are you gonna pay me but really, this comes down to price. Like yeah. So does it matter the location? <laughs> no. Okay. Oh, yeah. And it, yeah, well, I mean, if the location, if they're paying for it, I'll go anywhere. I have actually worked in like Germany, Barcelona, okay. UK, because oh, nice. they pay for the trip. I'm like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you pay half, you know, you spend half your paycheck extending your trip and doing exactly. whatever. But uh, yeah, again, you meet new people, you learn many things, and you get to travel. So for people listening, how do they get involved with this? this <laughs> I mean, this isn't like a fucking great thing to do, right? It's like, exciting you meet different people or travel like how do like i've never heard of, like this before i always thought <laughs> i always saw these trade shows like close like the close there's a beer trade show i always thought mm -hmm. the budweiser had their people speaking you know yeah. i didn't know it was like people like you doing this like so how do people get hired for this so a lot of it is through modeling agencies and talent agencies okay. um linkedin i've heard some people uh, get their jobs through it too i'm not on linkedin really ever at all anymore. I, I remember when that first came out, I think I was on it for like three years and then it's kind of trickled away just because I, I just find email mm -hmm. faster personal. Yeah. Um, I had like, I, I have ADHD. So for me, this is like the perfect jobs is my office again is different every time. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to just multitask, multitask, wrangle cats is what I call it when you're taking adults that are at a trade show, they do the museum head uh -huh. thing. <laughs> right. So they're they're all looking up. They don't know what's going on. And so you have to, your your main job for trade shows, uh, if you're considered like a booth host, is getting people into the booth. And and so they want like, hey, hey, doctor, come on in. Have you checked out X Y Z medication? And they're like, oh no, I haven't seen this yet. So then you take them in, and then you connect them with someone who actually works for the company. So it's this whole like interesting underground, I don't, again, tr I call it a traveling circus because we're just amazing people who connect with humans and you need to be able to socialize and read every single person from around the world. And everyone has different uh, Cute. yeah, Cute cues, stuff. mannerisms, or even just a cult you know, cultural changes. Like there are certain people that um, women can't touch it's just interesting. So there's like, you can't shake people's hands. So you have to recognize who those people are that you can't shake a hand or um, sometimes, you know, international people might not get a slang word. So you have to start speaking a little more open mouthed or talk slower and you just have to read the room. And sometimes you get creepers too. And oh, the yeah. creepers come. I can and, oh, those are the hardest. Cause then they're just, dit, 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 and the clients just are like, what is this person just chatting away? And then you're trying to get them out. You're like, yeah. no, I gotta get to, I gotta get to this, uh, someone who's actually serious and whatever. We're, so we're on a, you might notice, but average day, like how many people walk by the booth and how many people can you convince to come into the booth? Um, the last trade show I just worked at, um, this one, because that one, when I was doing the, the barista stuff. So that one wasn't getting people in the booth, but I made 400 cappuccinos, espressos a day. Okay. That That's you're just a lot. Pumping. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on a fast show. Um, yeah, I could talk to 600 people a day. Okay. Probably. It, it depends if you're having full conversations or just trying to get 
someone connected to another person in the booth. So again, every job is different in every single booth you go to. So sometimes you're just an assistant and you just sit at a table and people want to just make uh, RSVPs for meetings. So again, it, it's, it's kind of, okay, here's probably the best way. It's almost like a Craigslist <laughs> <laughs> with the odd jobs. If you go to the gigs, um, they, they'll just explain what they want done in that booth. I've, I've made chocolate in booth. I've, uh, gosh, I've done a game show. I, the, oh yeah, the colonoscopy show. There is a walk through colon. It's a blow up colon. Oh my goodness. And you walk through the stages of, of colon cancer, which, but they, they make it an educational way of doing they, they it. Try to, they try to make it sexy. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> and um, I was in charge of just counting and making sure people go through and do their, their little photos ops with it and on with your day so it yeah. it can be different <laughs> so for like what you do um what, what's the actual title of the job called trade usually it's trade show host okay um or trade show assistant so for that like post someone hires someone to be a trade host host or so assistant how do they determine that person was successful to bring it back right is it some kind of metrics or like how do they say hey yeah jason did a great job we're gonna bring him back or jason was was fucking horrible never talk to him again how does that work yeah it usually does come down to numbers uh either they want just a ton of numbers and hey we're gonna send out email lists we just want contacts give me contacts and let's just do it and then you just go around hey can i scan your badge can i scan your badge and then from there someone will filter what the badge information is and be like okay these people you know, our owners, these are assistants, ex buyers, et cetera. Some other ones where they're doing usually sales on site, those, those numbers are more about, can you find the big fish? Do that, you know, are they in the market? And you actually take that, that potential client who was just walking by, Hey, come on in. Hi, I have my, my X, Y, Z. Um, what do you want to call it? Um, seller. And you just connect. And from there, they'll make a deal and you're just kind of that middleman. You're the vessel that just gets that, that buyer into the booth. And that's what they want. They want contacts. And this yeah. thing you're going to keep on doing for a while. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I like to have a fun time doing it. It's so much fun. And everyone does work there for so long. It's, and I think that is the hardest part about getting into that part of the industry is someone has to leave for you to come in. Yeah. So I've known some people again, not only for the 20 years, but th some of those people had been working for 40 years and they're in their fifties they're in the sixties still doing this. And these people that work for you, are they like, is I'm guessing, is it a majority of females like doing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Probably like 95, 90%, if not higher. I'll probably say 90. It is, has gotten better. Actually. I think getting some men in a little more, not so airline stewardess style because <laughs> it definitely used to be. Yeah. yeah. And then especially with the auto shows, you see those, those little girls oh, in yeah. tight dresses yeah. and, uh, I like, feel in the like, '90s it was really heavy with that. Yeah, you're like <laughs> buy this Mercedes and get with me. Exactly, but, but not really, right? Yeah, right. And you already know she has a boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, some of those were my friends too, and they were they would just get all these numbers, and even the guys as well. Like there are more guys nowadays that are in the nice little suits, and you get your suits bought for you. They get them tailored. You go to. I remember we had. Oh, who was it? Was it? I forgot which designer it was, but we, they had all 12 of us girls in the same cute little dress that we got them all tailored up. And we just, yeah, they had us parade around uh, the trade show yeah. and carrying these little signs. And that's all we did. <laughs> but it looked like little airline stewardesses walking around. I'm using the word, I'm using the word airline stewardesses <laughs> because in the nineties they were still doing that. And that's yep. that again, that's why we're trying to separate that now to yep. flight attendant. Right. Um, but that's what they were kind of trying to go towards back in the day was that yeah i remember the first time i seen like, like a male yeah, first time i seen a, fl a male flight steward is what you gonna call it i'm like what is this like what's going on here right but it's not pretty much and it, yeah now. it's freaking awesome and it's yeah. just like it's it's so interesting to see how again 20 years they just wanted cute little pretty whatever and then they realized okay well we need more more educated um backgrounds for these tech shows these medical yeah. shows and so everyone's still amazing looking. Yeah, of um, course, of course. But also, like, not only work, do I work with amazing, fantastic people, but again, they're, they're smart as heck. And you can, you can, like, adapt to anything that's in there. And so, like, right now, let's say 
you were having a trade show booth and you're trying to sell these microphones. You're going to tell me in about an hour, hey, this is the tech info for the microphones. And I'm going to be like, okay, well, this thing, can you connect four at a time to the board? And you, you can tweak this and that. And that's how you sell it to the customer. Okay, nice. And how long have you been in your bartending business? Um, the business full-time now is been about five years. Okay. I started, of course, right before COVID. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely want to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And I've been bartending for over 10 years. So I think I'm at, I want to say about 12 years. So I started in Chicago. I actually worked in a nightclub. The largest one, it was Excalibur Castle Vision. And the reason it's so large is it used to be an old uh, funeral home that... You're kidding, right? Oh if my I could show you a photo, it literally looks like a castle, which is why it was called Castle later on. Um, so... <laughs> Multiple levels. You have what's the top of the the church? A steeple. So the, yeah. brick, the steeple was the office, and it was seven floors, nineteen bars, and I at one time probably twenty six bartenders, and then you still had your, your bottle service. You had two main stages plus like four other little tiny stages, and that just dove me into the lion's den. You're you got three people deep all the time, and then New Year's you're six people deep, six rows deep is what I mean by people deep, and you're just chugging away heads down before you know it 10 hours and you have to get like, some kind of bartending license or class or you just like start bartending uh, it's like a certification you can do or something like that so certain states require you to have a certification but you don't need any classes uh some people they have found help in that if they just don't know where to start luckily i actually was just a club promoter at the time so i already knew the people they could tell me how to do it and i was already like already part of the industry where I didn't need to learn anything special. Um, <laughs> with most bartenders, we are kind of against the classes because every bar is different. Every cocktail program is different. And every cocktail program manager has their own style and way. So a lot of times when you're working at a restaurant or bar, there's someone in charge of the cocktail menu. And then from there, you trickle down and you're like, hey, my little rubber duckies, like, my little babies, like, can you please make my my vision and will you keep cre creating my cocktail? And then from there, you know, when you're the bartender there and then you try to get your cocktails into the menu and become your bone bar manager. So you kind of work your way up that in that direction where people who have asked me, hey, do you know if I can get a cocktail class anywhere or should I do it? I want to get into it. I'm like, well, you got YouTube now. <laughs> um, and just like old fashions. Uh, everyone's different. Everyone makes it differently. And you kind of go to your favorite bartender that makes your favorite old fashioned because there is no s true specific way, even though there might be books that say, hey, this is, you know, one and a half ounce this, et cetera. But some people might put more sugar in or different kinds of sugar. Um, I just had an old fashioned in San Diego where she put lemon and orange peel in and it was just her way of doing it. She didn't put a cherry. And in Wisconsin, I'm looking at you again. Um, it's a whole different beast. They put Sprite in their old fashions and it's completely different than what we're used to in, in like the Pacific Northwest where it's just basically almost pure booze and just a little splash of the sugar. And so it's just interesting where everyone learns on the same classic cocktail. Let me ask you this. This is probably just my experience. Like with old fashions, either like I get old fashioned, either like, man, this is the most tastiest thing in the world. I mean, it's, it's so good. Or what the fuck is this? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I've never had like a, yeah, it's okay. It's always like, like a, the nectar, the God's juice or like, why did you still resue a water? Right. I love how you say that. Yes. Is that? I, I, I can see that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's not, not always just coming down to the specific bourbon you're, you're doing, but you know, that helps definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've gotten some people where they've muddled cherries and oranges to no end. And all of a sudden you just have a fruit salad in your drink. And you're like, I just want some booze. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want a meal. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I see that as well. And I've even had people where they would come to me like, I want you to make my old fashioned because yeah. I love yours. And then I've definitely seen it the other way. You know, I used to work at a bar where there was three bars that three bartenders in the same bar. And I would see that, you know, certain people go to that one, yeah. that person. It's not necessarily just personality. Yeah, or I've been places yeah. where one bartender, I mean, it's so great. Other bartenders are like, what, why? 
you should be fired like right, right now. And then, you know, and then when what's nice is at least with a lot of those bars, you're obviously getting the freedom to build, uh, you know, your your little scientific uh, concoction. Yep. And when you go to some place like Red Robin, I know tons of people who worked at Red Robin. And again, because it's corporate, a lot of their uh, cocktails are already pre-mixed in a bottle. And I feel bartending is a little more of an art form with science. And when you get that large where you're just like, one, two, three, and you go and you, you serve it. It's you're not excited about anything. Yeah. And again, the customer is also not excited because they're just getting the same thing. I feel, however, there are some people that, you know, I like the vanilla. If you like the vanilla life, that's fine. And you, that's, you want that consistency and you just get the same thing over and over. That's great. You know what you like, but I feel a lot of people who are going out drinking want to try new things and experience different tastes, especially when they're, when they're traveling. You're like, hey, what's local here? What's cool here? I come from XYZ, you know, state. I drank this, but what can you make that's cool that I can't get over? Yeah. Right so far, the best old fast I had was this lady named Sarah Compton. She was a bartender in the Motif a while ago. And mm -hmm. she, used, she used brown sugar with hers. Yes. Actually, I love, I used Demerara a lot. Yeah. And this is yeah, the Spanish brown sugar. That was so mm -hmm. tasty, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I could be wrong, but in order to drink, you have to be 21. But a bartender, you can only be, you, get, you just be 18, right? To serve it and to make so, it, but you still can't, but can't drink can it. Serve it. And it's, again, that depends on the state too. Mm -hmm. So that's what's so interesting. Uh, also just pay rate, pay, pay wise is completely different all over the country. I mean, you have to imagine like, maybe this is me, 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 but like, if you're 18, you're a bartender, you can't tell me that I'm not fucking sneaking drinks. Or like, you know, there's no fucking- I mean, <laughs> I didn't start, but <laughs> if you're in the small enough, business and yeah. they, I don't know yeah. it, it, it is a really big deal though if you get zapped oh, imagine, you know yeah. so you really don't want to risk it yeah that's true but after hours <laughs> that's a, when you're clocked out that's a whole yeah. other story and i again and, i don't and, know and, i didn't and, drink until and, way later and, actually and, and it's like cleaned up time you know yeah yeah or you're yeah i guess you're and everyone's like 21 23 to drinking <laughs> come on come on kid maybe drink, yeah, yeah i mean i worked in austin texas and there's it's a lot of people came in that you know, I was a temp, so I didn't know the people there, but all the regular bartenders, all the, some of these kids would come in and I'm like, I, I don't know. But they, did, so you know. did you walk on 6th Street or somewhere else? Yeah, I Sixth did. Street. There was a bar, I can't remember the name of it, but it was like, this is kind of off the wall, but they had like a, these margaritas, right? And like, they would do some like, they pose like these 10 margarita frozen things, right? Mm -hmm. And then with like, went to like the last ounce, they would then combine to like one drink, right? Wait, 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 wait. So there's like, it looks like the, there's like 10 frozen margarita things, mm -hmm. right? And when those margarita funnels, whatever, were about to have an ounce left. Oh. They put those 10 in like one drink. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not, not the most healthiest thing to do, oh. but it definitely did the job. No, that reminds me of New Orleans because they have the same, mm -hmm. but you can walk around the street with yeah. them. Ugh, so amazing. Yeah. I ended up doing uh, South by Southwest for a few years. Okay. And unfortunately, COVID again, just yeah, ruin the that, businesses. That's, that's, that's my bucket list to go to. I, I wanted to go to South by South by Southwest. Definitely worth it. And they, yeah, they closed down the whole streets. So just big parties. Uh, it's getting a little more corporate -y with these wristbands and yeah. you have to buy these tickets to other places. But if you just kind of avoid the yeah. large advertisements of all that and you yeah. still keep going to the small places, yeah. you're still going to find like, amazing all, all, local all, artists. All the live music, all the mm -hmm. art going on, all the tech yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely my bucket list. So you, I know you can't answer this, but like back when I used to go to bars and stuff, you know, actually hang out, right? It's like you go to a bar and it'd be like, you know, you get a drink, it'd be so watered down. Like I'm, I'm never buying this drink again. <laughs> or like, or like this, what's it called? Heavy pour, right? Yeah. Is there a reason people do that or like? Well, um, so in the U.S., a standard pour is one and a half ounces, technically. I mean, if you go to a lot of the recipe books, it's going to be one and a half, one and a half. In Canada... They pour one ounce on the East Coast. Some places still pour one ounce. That used to be uh, just the standard back then. Um, what we call a half shot is a cowboy shot. So were they even drinking smaller back then? I don't know. Well, someone will have to look up the entomology on that one. But <laughs> uh, I still feel some places still do one ounce pours. And that is just their choice. I actually worked for a bar. He was an ex-fireman. Amazing guy, but he never bartended in his life. And he's just like, I'm retiring. I want to open up a bar. 
and I had lived down the street. So I had gone there a couple of times and he's like, Hey, I'm I, so he's like, Hey, I'm looking for a bartender. And I was like, Oh, I'm one. And he's like, Oh, cool. Will you work my margarita bar for me? I'm like, all right, cool. And then I worked the margarita bar and he's like, you want a full-time job here? I'm like, well, I can do part-time. I still had, I was still working at the club at the time. I was like, okay, I'll still work for you. It's a three minute walk from my house. And, and I'm, I'm doing my, my normal pours and, and then, uh, he's like, Hey, that's, that's too much. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, this is like your normal pour. He's like, no, they're one ounces. And, he's, and I'm like, why would you say they're one ounce? He's like, well, I watched Bar Rescue. <laughs> I'm like, well, the Bar Rescue, he was t- talking to me about. Yeah, I've seen he it. Was, it, was in, it was in Canada. I was like, no, you can't. <laughs> you can't. Ca- one, you just shouldn't copy what, what a reality show is doing. Uh, but two, I was like, no, like the standard here is one and a half. You're literally shorting people. They're charging the same. And then from there, like he fixed it. It was cool, but this just showed, you know, you just it was, didn't have the education on that, that part yet. Um, so it just happens. And then your your uh, old fashions, martinis, they get to two ounces, three ounces. Um, and then the whole great part of dives are what we call is free pouring. And that is legal in most states, but some states you can't, you have to use the, the measuring jigger. Um, and you, you gotta be precise. Uh, with thankfully in Seattle, you can free pour and we just count is usually what we do. So we see those, we call them speed pours and you just count, you count to three and half and you pull it. And so sometimes you kind of count to four. <laughs> and one, one, one of my friends was at a bar and knew the other bartender, right? And she's, and she's like, I'm going to give you a special drink. And he's like, oh, okay. And she's like, I'm going to give you the standard industry pour. And she's doing this and she's looking at him in the <laughs> eyes and it was six seconds. <laughs> and uh, I mean, what if you ask for a double? That's what you're going to get anyway. Yeah. But it was, it was really good. I'm guessing like, you know, like suppose, suppose someone orders a drink for me, right? Suppose a drink costs $10 mm-hmm. and they give you a $10 tip on top of that. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing that's going to kind of influence you mm-hmm. to make the drink it a helps. little bit better next time. Or at least faster service if you yeah. can't help, like, yeah. help them out. Yeah. 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 Yeah, tip, and tip your bartenders, everyone. Tip your bartenders. I mean, I think the national uh, start for tip wages, I believe, is still either $2.16 an hour or $3.16 an hour. Um, and I, when I was in Chicago, I was four ninety. It did not take care of all my taxes. Yeah. And so you got to try to find that balance um, on your tip wages. And thankfully, in, in Seattle, it's... It's a really good price, um, but the cost of living here is so high that you yeah. still you still need tips. Yeah. So, um, suppose someone the only job is being a bartender, say like seven days a week, mm. can, can they make a decent living? Like decent being subjective? Yes. The hard part is you can't go down the rabbit hole of spending your tip money on drinks all the time. <laughs> so when, what happens is the community, the bartending community, is amazing and it's so tight knit. There's plenty of little pages, you know, online like Facebook or Instagram, whatever, for, for bartenders in your area, um, which also, if you are interested in bartending, that's something good to look up. Um, and so because we know each other, not only, not only do, do we just ask questions through this, but we're like, hey, who's working here tonight? Who's working here tonight? And so you take your cash money and you, you go say hi to everybody. And the, the joke is there's... Three million dollars nationally floating around <laughs> between bartenders of just tipping because we will tip our fifty percent, hundred percent, and we just keep tipping back and forth. And we're not. Where's that money going? It's just staying between the bar, staying in the community. Yeah, so to speak. yeah. So that's a nice little perk. So how does someone become a bartender? How do they break into it? It kind of is some about all who you know. I mean, the bar I work at now in Seattle. I was a regular there for three years, and. I always loved it. And then one day I was like, hey, are you guys hiring? And they're like, well, no, but, you know, we'll let you know if something opens up. And they really knew my background, uh, working in Chicago at least. But if you do go to a couple bars, you talk to the other bartenders, really. You, you get to know it. And as you're hanging out more, you're just going to observe, uh, you know, how customers are. You know, that's the major one. If you can't handle customers gracefully, you're not going to last long. If you're a... Um, diva, you're not going to last long and you have to be able to work with everyone and communicate, be patient and also be able to multitask and stre- get your stress together all at the same time. Yeah. So talking to someone at the bar, whether they're hiring or not, 
or they might know other bars that are hiring because again, we're connected in, in these groups. So here's one for you. Which one would get hired first, right? There's two people. One is like an A skill, <laughs> a bartending, a C, a customer service. Mm. Other one is the opposite. Mm. It might depend on the bar. If they're more like a fancier hotel bar, then they need people just looking good. And again, their cocktails might be pre-batched already. You might want to go with that person who's more customer service related. Um, and maybe just, maybe they just don't work as fast, but they're still making a quality drink. That's probably going to be more for maybe kind of more corporate world side where family bars or even in your good mixology bars, you still also have to be fast. And so if you're not fast and good at what you do, um, and not, I'm not saying fast as in losing any quality. You, you just got swift, I guess. You got to do both of them, yeah. Yeah. And so that would be probably you're on your A game as a personality. Um, but also if you're really good at making cocktails and you kind of don't talk to people as much, we call this the well. And when you're stuck in the well, um, you're, you're the person that's head down. You got the tickets flying and you're making all the drinks for the tables in the restaurant. So there's usually one designated person that makes the tables and your server's coming to that person and hey, table three needs these drinks. And then there's the bartenders who are actually working at the bar that, that people are sitting down at. And so, you know, if you're at the bar, you're obviously talking to more people. Yeah. If you're in, you're in the well, um, yeah, you're just head down, just being that mixologist, a mad scientist and just sending out drinks as fast as you can. For all the so how do bartenders do it where like they do a drink and it comes back, hey, so-and-so said this is like something's wrong with it, right? Uh -huh. You just like remake it or you get an attitude or you get mad. Like this is a perfect, a this is a perfect drink, you motherfucker. Like, <laughs> We're guilty of the bitching a little bit. Yeah. Um, when you say it's too weak, that's, that's probably the hardest part because again, we know what we poured. Yeah. Um, a you, lot of people. You, you like tell them they need to order double. Then. No, yeah. Well, that's the funny thing. So the joke, one of the jokes are, can you make it strong this time? I will make a double. No, can't make it strong because they don't want to pay the double. Yeah. They just want the extra booze. You're like, no, I'm going to either you get a double or you're going to get a regular. I'm not making a one and a half. Dude. Yeah. It's like it, it's like ordering steak at rare plus You're, you're It's a one and a half degree difference. You know, like I'm, I'm sure if, if someone did the research, those people like want the double for free. They mm -hmm. probably tip the, the shittiest. Also, light ice. Mm -hmm. They think they're getting more booze. No, you're going to get more mixer. So you're actually going to get taste less booze because oh, we're trying to fill the cup up. I didn't know up. that. Mm -hmm. I always thought you got a lot of, like, like if you order Coke, I always thought you order like less ice, you get more Coke. Or yeah. Just, okay. Yeah. You get more, you get more liquid. Okay. Or let's say, let's say this is your glass and a normal cocktail ends up here when you have ice to keep the delusion. De delusion. Ah, I'm deluded. <laughs> to keep the delusion. What am I? I haven't even had a drink yet. <laughs> We'll blame on your flight. Come I'm going to reset. So when you add ice, <laughs> it dilutes what you're doing. <laughs> and there is a reason they put the full scoop in. And that way you get a perfect ratio. Okay. So when you're putting in less ice, technically, if you're going to make the same cocktail, you're, let's say you normally would fill your mixer up to here, then your mixer, you would hear okay. it. And then the people then are thinking they're getting shorted, but they ask for less ice. Otherwise, if you just add more mixer too, again, so actually like a kind of like a scientific reason. It really is. Yeah, there's there's ratios to everything, and again, they're, then they're going to complain they don't taste the booze because there's more mixer. Yeah, but some people do want that, and they, hopefully everyone figures it out as quick as they can. But uh, some don't, <laughs> and just think they're going to get that Long Island with three pieces of ice, <laughs> and they're going to get a double somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so this question could be all over the place, right? So suppose someone's a new bartender, right? So they work at a, at a, like a place, a bar where like, there's not really many customers. They work at a dive bar. There's like fucking <laughs> people coming all the time or like an established club where it's like, like steady clientele or does it matter? It depends on the personality, I think. And again, like, I, like, again, I'm the ADHD person. So I work best when I get thrown in lion's den and I have to survive and I just go for it. So that is why my first job was at that, um, that nightclub in Chicago. I went right in. Uh, other people who have asked me, I kind of try to read them a little bit. Maybe sometimes like, hey, just start a beer or wine, work on your customer service. So whether it's busy or not, I'm not sure 
if that would matter because you're just pouring, you're not really mixing. So that way you can figure out how people work in their heads because one, you don't want to get stuck in a long conversation with someone sometimes because if you do get busy, you, you need to keep going. So you need to figure out what someone wants without taking too long. You got to be graceful about it. And then customer service wise, you get a cranky customer, something happened, you need to be able to deescalate. Or also the other thing about bartending is you're kind of like a flight attendant, which I wonder if they're similar because safety first, you're all about safety. You have to be on point to not only just maybe check IDs, but fights can come about, come about and you're the only one there. Um, actually, the, the main reason I started my business, uh, <laughs> Seattle is a fire at will state. They can hire you for anything, any reason, or not hire you for, for any reason. And I legit got turned down twice because I'm a woman. Like we don't hire women at my bar. And, or, or we don't let women close because it's at nighttime. And thankfully I am a big girl and I'm like, Oh, your guy over there is half my size. I could take him out right now. Um, so that's something also to think about. Like if you go to a dive bar, you're probably going to encounter some fights. You're going to kick people out. You're going to also be the bouncer security. You're going to be medical too. You, you need to know your Heimlich maneuver. You need to know your CPR. Uh, drug overdoses happen. So you need to know when something, someone's kind of on a drug and you got to be like, I can't serve you liquor. You got to look for all these little things. And so it's not just about serving and you're, you're, you have to be a part of the whole community within that building. Yeah. I remember like, so a couple places down, there's a place called Central Saloon here, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, it's supposed to been open in 1892. It's like they have live music every night. I'll go there once in a while to eat lunch or just hang out, right? The one time I was there, it's pretty crowded, like seven o'clock. And this, and these two people, three, I guess there were four people, right? I think they're, they had like a Ukrainian accent, Russian accent, but none of them had the right ID, right? It was like, it's something they can oh, accept yes. and they like argue with the mm -hmm. bartender, you know, I want to get, I want to drink. Here's my, this is good Ukraine. I'm not good here. And the lady like light as it could like, but finally they had to bring someone else in like, Hey Joker. Yeah. You got to leave. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> yes, we all have to deal with that. I feel actually pretty bad for most of the international travelers that come in here. Cause they're like, what the heck is all this ID and this, and it, it there's so many rules. And I do find Washington state one of the hard, like strictest and I did Google it at one point and we're like number three for strictest alcohol um, uh, regulation. And then we're like number 12 is most stressful uh, with IDs and, right. and um, liquor control and all that. Cause coming from Chicago, you can still bring, you can have liquor on the street in a paper bag and you're fine. Um, no one, no one asks for your ID when you go in. It's very rare uh, for, for but in Seattle. Like you have to check every single person. You can't have a vertical. You can't, that, this is what's happening. That's what it was, that, mm -hmm. the ID was vertical. That's what it was, it was vertical. Vertical. And then the other one, when it's international, no, one, no one's carrying around their passports. No. We're only allowed to look at passports because you can at least hear you're classically trained to look at them. Yeah. We don't know they what an Australian driver's license look like, you know, or fake one would look like, right? So... Uh, that is the hardest part because they, they show us their like EU, uh, identification and I'm like, I'm sorry, we can't like, yeah. And think of like, I mean, you could tell they were in like thirties or forties, right? They, 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 they did not, yeah. like, they might look young at all. Right. Depending on the policy at your place. Like if you're 50 and you don't have a, a property that's valid because if it's expired, we still can't take it. Yeah. And I, people always are like fighting you about it. You're like, it's really just for, for our safety and it's the law. Ooh, hey. Um, and you know, as, don't, don't shoot the middleman. I'm sorry. Yeah. But yeah, you get some people that are just really ticked off about it. I remember it. the guy said, I just want to have a drink in a bar in America. <laughs> Why is it so <laughs> fucking hard? It is, I know it is. It's so hard. It's so regulated. And if, if I ever get like older with like spare time and spare money, I want to like go through all the little weird little laws that just don't matter anymore. Like I know there's a law in, in the South that like, you can't have a, uh, an alligator on your leash or like some yeah, of those other laws, you can't yeah. pull your pantyhose up in public. Yeah. 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 So I just want to get to, like rid of those little things and maybe it'll be easier. I don't know. Yeah, I, made it, I guess it made sense back in 1812, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. It's like, or tech wasn't around for whatever it is. I, everyone tries to show you like, I have a picture of my ID on my phone. I'm like, anyone could Photoshop that. Like, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
So I was like, no, I can't take it. I have seen some fakes. It's and they're bad. <laughs> I had a fake passport once, and I'm like, your ink is bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> like, how's this your passport photo? Your girl, your girlfriend's in the picture with you. <laughs> is that your are cat? You, are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you you should at least crop it out? <laughs> exactly. Can you be a little smarter than that? <laughs> so as ever, how does this work, right? Suppose someone comes to you like they order a drink, but it's not a real drink. They say, Hey, I want to make this for me. Like a shot of crown, a shot of tequila, mm -hmm. Sprite. You just like, can you make it for them? Yeah. But then, but then, how do you determine what the price is? Um. So typically, uh, it's gonna be whatever the most expensive booze is in there, really. Because either way, you're still gonna put the same amount of booze in. So they, yeah, let's say they did crown, yeah, crown and peach schnapps and something else. Um, you're gonna charge them for the crown, um, even though you're 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 putting in two liquors that measure to that one and a half ounce. But whatever the more expensive one is typically, that's how you're going to get your overhead, you know, worth on it. Yeah. So the best liquor is called Top Shelf, right? Yeah. <laughs> and is the worst liquor, is it called Bottom Shelf? Well, they call it Well. Well, or, okay. yeah, I mean, you could call it Bottom, but usually it's well. well. And again, that whole in the well, that, I mean, that's it. It, it is literally the watering hole of the bar, right? And um, uh, back in the day, that that was where you would get your water. Uh, way back in cowboy days, <laughs> have you heard about the troughs? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh for, yeah. For all you kids at home who don't know, um, because it was mostly men. I mean, if you're a woman, you're a hooker. Uh, in the cowboy era, you go to the bar and you'd sit down and you'd be stepping on all the sawdust and it smelled already. And because there were no washrooms and they're just drinking and sitting, there's just a little trough in front. Where you yep. sat, where you peed in, so you nice, know that nice, place. Nice and sanitary. Yeah, you just drink and pee, drink and pee, and you never nice had to get sanitary. up. <laughs> That's one thing, like, when people, like, complain about living a day, you know, like, go back 100 years, right? Seriously? Yeah, like, this is the best time to live, my mom, like, oh, you know, 100 years ago, there's no electricity. Right. Outhouses, like, uh, like, say, pissing uh -huh. and drinking, right? <laughs> Thank goodness for toilet paper. Yeah. I don't know what I do without toilet paper. I, I mean, ugh. <laughs> Wash some rags. Yeah, yeah at least. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing that human society survived all that crap. Uh -huh. You know, <laughs> probably just like, to kill ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, we definitely have survived. <laughs> so, is there, of course, the, the there's a big difference in price between top shop and well, mm -hmm. but is there really a difference in quality and taste and all kind of stuff? Some of it, yeah, especially with tequila. Um, Tequila yeah, and have a lot that. of additives. Up yeah, the I definitely side. agree. There's a big difference between uh, Jose Corvo. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of caramel colorings. There's, um, oh my gosh, what's the sweetener? Uh, a corn syrup. Oh, yeah. So sometimes we'll, we'll put in a little bit of corn syrup for certain flavored items instead of cane sugars or, again, that, that demerara, the, the brown sugars yeah. for other things. Um, so a lot of people with allergies actually don't do wells because they have those those odds and ends that are in there, even dyes um, on the bottom shelves where typically, you know, more of the top shelves, middle middle shelves are going to be, they're colored just from the actual cask that they're in. Um, sometimes a lot of places will like burn the cask. So that way you get that caramel coloring that they, whatever level they want of shape. Okay. Yeah. So maybe this is my experience, but it's like whenever I go to a bar or whatever, suppose I say, I want to, we say, um, I don't know, the bourbon or coke, right? Mm -hmm. It's like they automatically get me a well. Yes. It, mm -hmm. it seems like they would ask, it sounds like they were like I'm trying to upgrade, right? Hey, you want to upgrade the top shelf? How come they don't do that? Some places do. Um, it's like a customer always has to ask, hey, yeah, I want, I want like a, I would say I want old fashioned, but use, you know, mm -hmm. Blattens or, you know, Woodwolf. Exactly. But if you don't, they give you some, you know, Jack yeah. Daniels and Beam, right? It's right. Like, it's like they would ask you to upgrade because, the drink costs more and then I don't know, maybe the tips more. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you hope that works out, you know, typically it is a 20% tip, right? So does that extra $2 to $5 to $8, you know, it kind of depends on that. Right. Um, some of it, I think it's just, if you're busy, you know, you just don't have time to keep asking yeah, these questions. Yeah. And I think most people do now assume that that's, if they don't, specify they're going to get that well however with like old fashions manhattans anything that's a specific cocktail not just like whiskey coke uh i usually do ask do you want anything specific and they'll usually be like no well's fine okay um tip wise i don't know if that affects it or not i don't think there's been enough 
where it really yeah. does, unless they're drinking a ton of them or the whole table's drinking them. You know, especially, yeah, if there's five people drinking the same cocktail and it's a seven difference between a $7 one and a $12 one, that's going to add up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not sure if that's enough for an incentive of that. Um, but that is kind of the trick is the well you don't see, right? Because it's at the bottom yeah. and all the top shelves behind you. It's there. The billboard's there. It's up to them if they want to buy. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a favorite bourbon? Oh, I go through phases. Um, I've been doing the small batch for roses recently. That's actually at my house right now. Yeah. Yeah. I have that. I didn't like that. No, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> and again, everybody likes it different. Yeah. And that's, that's my hot toddy one right yeah. now. Um, yeah, I do like a sweeter, I think, smoother for my... Have you, have you traded? I think it's called Bade and Blonde. No. It's the one it's... with the, has the, the key around the yes. table thing. Yeah. yeah I, like, I like that a lot. I, I don't think I've had that in old fashioned. I think it's called Bade and Blonde. It's been, I'm thinking, I'm also thinking of Larceny. Um, they also have a keyhole. Uh, and if I've had the shots again, I can't remember if I've had it. <laughs> um, and then also you just, you do... Just try so many you don't remember anymore. Yeah. It's, it's it's all out there now with all these celebrity ones too. It's just clogged with all these companies. And yeah, do you go with the old tried and true, or do you try all the new stuff? Yeah. You know. Kind and of then again, like you know, you want to try different stuff, but do you want to pay like 30, 40 bucks a mm -hmm. bottle? Yeah, those Blattens. Oh my gosh, yeah, <laughs> those are delicious. But they're my bar's cheap at twenty six dollars a shot. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> Yeah, Blanton. I remember for a while, no one you can find Blanton's anywhere, no. right? Yep, and that's exactly why it's so expensive because they're they're not changing how much they're making, yeah. you know, until the future because mm -hmm. they're, you know, just aging in barrels. There's nothing yep. else you can do but just yeah. sit there and wait, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just taste it. One time, I was trying to find Blanton's, no one had it, and a good friend of mine, hey, I, he had who's on a podcast, have him bring over some my, with the rest of my Blanton's. He had like a maybe like that much of a lift. Uh -huh. It was, it was uh -huh. so good, right? Like, man. Yep, I still have my horsey cork from my last bottle yeah. <laughs> and people collect those. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, if you have, so like people, the whole Blatton com community is like, do you, do you have the little horse with the A, <laughs> do you have the horse with the B and uh -huh. people are exchanging the, the tops and the bottles. And yep. so it's not just the drink, like they've created whole, whole brand a whole, community. seriously, actually, I just saw, it was the neatest thing, a Lego Latin's bottle. Okay. And so apparently Lego got either it's a private person making it or Lego mm -hmm. themselves. But I was absolutely astonished that they put the Lego brand like combined, right? Yeah, that seems like a good match. Yeah. It, you think kids, but yeah, but you, there are so many adults, and there's this whole premium section of Legos now. There you is. buy a kit. Uh, one of my friends he bought this like I guess a rose. They're supposed to look like roses. And they're tiny little Lego, so it almost looks real. And I think he paid like $130 for this one Lego kit. Yeah. And it's Star Wars one too. I know it's like hundreds of dollars for these Lego kits for the adults. <laughs> so tell me, how did your business survive COVID? Whew. Yeah, that's a, that was a trip. Um, I think what happened was once the bars shut down, um, everyone, all the bartenders either went into tech or real estate. And they're like, I'm out. I, I need money. I need insurance. Um, and something has to happen. So they kind of, I feel like their personalities all kind of went to those two main sections. Um, once outdoor were able to open up again, people have to get married. And so people were begging for bartenders. I was double booking, triple booking, because there weren't any bartenders out there and people were just asking, asking, asking. And they're all doing these, these outdoor barn wet, weddings. And so with all the other people who either just ended up getting new jobs or maybe they were too scared to work. I, I'm not sure. Um, at this time there were the vaccines and everything and we were all still wearing masks. So I felt safe and just bartended there and then word got out. And I even have some clients that I've married. I've done their baby showers. I've done their kids' first birthdays, and I'm at the point, I'm like, here, here's my adoption papers. Just, like, get me into your family at this point. It's so cute. Like, So now with all these original people that I've married off, like, I still keep in contact with them and work all their other events. And so I think word of mouth really is what happened, and I think just because I was one of the few fish left in the sea at that time, uh, it, it just kind of skyrocketed from there. And then people had to move their weddings over, so I had – one person, she had to go two years until I actually worked for worked her wedding. Yeah. Nice. 
So we're going to talk about your business in a little while, but right now we're going to have you make a. Uh -huh. So I'm going to turn over to Natasha. And she's going to walk her walk through the process okay. of making a smoked old fashioned. Well, I'm going to have to step away from the mic to okay. pop this out of the box. Okay. <laughs> And this kit's a really large kit because again, I work weddings with a hundred people, 200 people, but if you just get the wooden staves or sometimes you see these little, call them like wooden halos and the corks. So you can do them at home with just like on top of your single glass and take some time with it. Uh, mine is a little bit built more for speed. It's like a giant hookah, <laughs> but we're smoking chips. Can you, can you smell it? Yeah. And how much does one of these things cost? Um, you're probably getting around for a hundred bucks. Okay, you know? Pretty, that's decent. Yeah, they're not too bad. And they're rechargeable. I just plug them in USB, but- And you have to like like replace them every once in a while because of use and stuff or- You gotta clean them out. Okay. Um, yeah, this one's kind of gunky right now. It's, it's almost time. Do they come like huh? new updated versions and stuff? That they probably entice you to buy? I haven't seen much. Um, this dome that I'm using for this cocktail is pretty big because you can actually smoke food in this too. So you can take a piece of fish and, and do it as well. But I do love these glass bell ones that are also out there and they spit one single drink. Um, they look really nice too. Uh, but this one I can sometimes do two drinks at a time and again, you know, built for speed. Are there certain bourbons that are like better to smoke versus other ones? I that. haven't come to a conclusion yet. Okay. I feel it is still comes down to more personal taste, but if they are sweeter, like kind of like a maker's mark, it might not work as well as if you get something a little more on that, like that sharper side, if you know what I'm talking about. Like, oh, not quite rye, but rye would be good. Um, smoking tequila is really nice. I also brought a lovely mezcal when I was in Oaxaca. Um, so I was warm in it. Wow. <laughs> it really does affect the taste. I've told myself I never have a tequila or mezcal <laughs> with a worm. I and this is my favorite now. Okay. It, it's it's crazy how this one little organism can affect the taste of a bottle, and it just gets better as it sits in there. Um. So yeah, it's just fun. You can smoke anything that you want. I need to find the top. So which, what bourbons do we have? I saw, I know that's your collection over there. Yes, we have the Bullet, the Wooden Real Whiskey. We have this Frank August. Ooh, yes. What's this guy? Oh yeah. Oh, I recognize him. Fantastic. All right. So we're gonna feel like the caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland. Okay. <laughs> this will smoke up the room and I'm hoping uh, no one in this office building is thinking the place is on fire. Yeah, okay. All that <laughs> no we're sprinklers. Here, all that we're here smoking dope or something. Right. <laughs> we are in Seattle. <laughs> all right. So I got some apple with us today, apple chips. So I chose that one, uh, you know, a little extra flavor. This might take another minute. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And then I did bring our bitters and an orange so we can get real fancy here. And you got your glass over there, right? And I brought my favorite stir, it's my Cthulhu. <laughs> and so what's some of the like, big difference between, between like a regular old fashioned and a smoke old fashioned? I mean, I feel smoked old fashioned might have a little more illusion of a body to it. Um, you're just gonna get more and more flavor profiled and kind of like a treat. Yeah, but it's like high, more hot class, right? Yeah, I, yeah there's just something uh, about uh, it. You're, uh, you're uh, literally uh, cooking it kind I of. I mean, it's already hot class, older, older, old fashioned, but it's another <laughs> level. No, I wanna smoke the old fashioned. Right? And, you know, maybe you could have three, four old fashions in a sitting sometimes if you're on it. I, I can't imagine having more than maybe two smoke, but I'm sure there's people out there that do.
Yeah, the setup that this thing takes. I'm guessing. <laughs> Like, I'm guessing you charge more for a smoke. How much more do you charge for a smoke old fashioned versus a regular old fashioned? Uh, well, since since I usually do this at open bars, uh, it's it's usually I just rent the service, and it typically takes an extra bartender. So really, I charge the extra bartender price, so whatever whatever that could be. Um, and then I usually do about just fifty bucks. Okay. Yeah, you got you got to buy the wood chips. They they have to be food safe. They can't be just some crazy wood chip you just get out from someone's logs <laughs> you know so this setup kind of reminds me like someone doing like an espresso machine right like yeah yeah and that's why kind of the two go together a lot of bartenders have been baristas and that's again kind of i think why i ended up doing the barista work yeah. at the trade shows as well yeah so there's this little guy here and this is our little crazy tube that and you usually just kind of chuck it under the dome now if you get some nicer ones or if you have a long time there's a little hole in the side then you can really like let it sit because the trick is the smoker you want it you just let it sit and soak in um do, do I, all right i'm gonna use i'm gonna do your bourbon and then maybe i'll do a mezcal another time yeah or actually do you want me to make yours first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and i'm just gonna do whatever because yeah, this is amazing yep. <laughs> so I'm going to put the ice in now because if you can get it into the, the cubes too I feel it, it sticks a little better I'm using my hands <laughs> again health practices when it's in private form is a little different um, so normally what I would do I'd have some Demerara, um, which we're just kind of more doing bourbon straight here. Uh, then we light her up. There's a little button up here that's going to intake the air. I hope I'm not smoking your mic. <laughs> <laughs> and please don't tell me my battery's out. Oh, no. Technical difficulties. And this is part of it. Hmm. Oh, is they rechargeable? All right, we're gonna have to wait for this, I think. Okay. I think we uh didn't get her charged as much as I was hoping to. All right. It's pouting. Well, we can still have booze. Yeah. <laughs> I can uh try to plug it in if we find a USB box, if not. If not, we'll find a way. Okay. But we you, can... you need a USB port or something? Yeah. I heard it going, but that is not the sound it's supposed to make, and it's blinking at me. Hmm. About this right here. Yes. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Try that. And then just want to double check. I'm not gunked up here. Kind of have to be a mechanic too. So, so while you're doing this, so this drink, I'm going to drink it. It's going to be interesting for me, right? Because I'm actually doing a water fast right now. Oh, it's going to hit you hard. And this is, like, <laughs> and this is, and I, this is day nine of my water fast. Holy cow. Yeah. How are you feeling? I feel good, actually. Yeah. I mean, of course, I'm a little hungry, you know, but, you know, but I, I feel good. I feel focused. So, okay. yeah, this is definitely going to fucking hit me. I think I've done like three days maybe yeah. on that. Yeah. I do my once in a while. The longest I've done is 21 days. I did, I did 21 day water fast one time. Really? Yeah. Okay. Like, I'm going to be wrong. The first three days, like, fuck, I can't do this. But once you hit like day eight, nine, it's like, yeah. It's like, okay. Yeah. Nothing. Very nice. But then your body tells you, okay. Motherfucker, you need to eat something. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I, yeah. I'm craving it. Yeah, you just got to listen to your body. But I this did, has been be very interesting. I did keto, and that was amazing. And uh, made me feel really good. But I've never done more than like three days. Oh, I see what's happening. So my my motor's gunked up. Okay. So we're going to keep trying here. Okay. And now you see it moving, right? Yeah. It wasn't even moving at all. Right. Um, And again, yeah, that's, that's what happens when you do so many of these is... is 
uh, there's the smoke sucks in and you get this lovely um like layer it's here faster now yeah i'm trying not to burn out the motor but we're getting somewhere no no, no person on top no okay. no, no person on top <laughs> i should hopefully loosen up all right okay. all right maybe another minute we'll let it run and okay. it's looking there we go okay so hey oh, okay, of course when we say we're still we're done yeah there we go nice Awesome. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Have the camera on you to just walk through the whole process. Yes. I know it's not the... Again, the other the other part about bartending, uh, we call it knolling. And it's also for tools of the trade. Anyone, it's when you line up everything and make it look good and pretty, but you also have everything set out where you need it to be. And um, I'm kind of a, a fan of knolling, and I am definitely not doing it right now. <laughs> All right, so we got the motor running. We're going to pop the air intake up here. And for your kids at home, uh, yeah, it's like a big hookah where you put the chips on top, but it's kind of like a smoking gun, so it's not like a tower as a hookah would be. But you still have a tube that runs out towards it, which if you've ever done hookah, that's kind of where you smoke in from. And then a little button that changes the speed on how much you want. So we're going to light without again, without me lighting the mic on fire, <laughs> put it on that way. It's sucking in, sucking in some air. We're going to light this guy. It still might be a little gunked up. There we go. All right. So you see that smoke coming out. All right. Smoke show. All right, so I like to put it directly into the drink. When you have the bell curves, the bell um, domes, um, I find it a little easier. So I'm going to plop it in here, little hole. We're going to keep it going. Let's go back a little bit. Sorry. That's good. That's better. There we go. All right, so we're going to let it sit for a moment. Ooh-wee. That's pretty fast. It doesn't like you're leaving a long time, right? Yeah, well, because now you're letting it sit for as long okay. as you want. So once you have the dome filled with the smoke, it's on you to how long you want it to stay in there. Uh, and can, because I'm doing usually faster services, I kind of just stick it into there, let it go. Um, and you can let it sit as long as you want, as smoke as you want. We're going to go. Does the longer you let it sit affect anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll absorb more. And again, that's why I like to put the ice in there. So that kind of sticks as well. But obviously, if you let it sit too long and your ice is melting. So you try to find that balance. Uh, and then I kind of like to puff it so that way, it, you know, you keep pushing it in there. And then voila. And give it a try. And if you like a little orange peel, I'm happy to add it. Yeah, let's do orange yeah. peel. Let me get this free bartender service while I can. <laughs> uh, get some zest in there. And then the nice part, yeah. Give it a little twist. Now that's that orange zest is on top. And Thank enjoy. You. You're welcome. You're now. I am. What do I want to use? All right, we're gonna do the woodenville. We're going we're going local. <laughs> now do you do you taste? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely taste it. Mm -hmm. And if you like it, you just let it sit there for a whole minute, you know. Okay. And a lot of people uh, always are like, why are my drinks taking so long? Why are my drinks taking so long? This is one example, like yeah. if, especially if they're offering it. But also when you get into those fine cocktails, you you want to be as precise as you can. That way you're getting all the flavors. You, there are glasses out there that are specially shaped just for sniffing or just for, you know, an old fashioned. That way you get the notes from your nose first, right? First you look at your eye with your eyes, then you're going to smell, then you're going to taste, then you're going to get the feel and you're like umami, right? And you go through all these stages and yeah, you don't, you don't want it to just be something you fly out the door with. And <laughs> it's that, that's the hardest part about being a cocktail, like bartender compared to like maybe a dive bartender is you, you're making more of these and people don't tip any differently. 
because they think their service is getting slow and they're like, oh, and then they get sticker price too, like sticker shock. Oh, so they're like, oh, this is expensive. And it took long. And then you end up getting the same tip as someone who just gave you a shot in a beer. So <laughs> this is why, because you have to do a lot more. Well, it's an art to it. Exactly. And there's some people I know that make these wooden staves specifically for their own um, cocktails. So let's say I wanted to make my own signature uh, old fashioned and I've, I've got, you know, my woodenville over here and I'm going to put a wooden stave that has like applewood, we'll say, because that's actually what we smoked with. This was applewood. Um, and then you stick it in there. It's, it has to be food safe. So that's the hard, you have to find the right wood for it and, you know, make sure it's not treated or anything. And then um, you let it sit there for, you know, a week or two, whatever your cocktail is doing. So not only is it specifically your own, but now you're limited to your amount too. So every drop counts. And yeah, there's just so much more that goes into the behind the scenes when it comes to drinks. Like uh, there's also these milk punches that a lot of people love to make and they put their heart and soul in it. You have to do a straining through cheesecloths and it takes days to make days. And you might get a gallon's worth out of it. And it's, when it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> Again, I'm also why it would cost a lot because okay. limited edition, bartender only, you're never going to get this anywhere yeah. else. You know, so um, it's been, it's really fun to get creative. And sometimes you do it and you're like, oh no, what did I just do? <laughs> so you you go through the trials and errors. <laughs> like, you probably don't know this, but how has how that orange pills became the thing to put in the drinks versus like lemon pills or something, some all the other fruits you could do or you know, you know i've heard a lot of different stories um because i heard lemon was kind of where the original was and i know a lot of people prefer well, not maybe not a lot i feel uh the voiced opinions uh really or the squeaky wheels really like no I, lemon brings it out so much more um i have not really dove down that rabbit hole where okay. where the orange came in where the uh cherry came in i know where citrus Typically, lime came in is because it's also antiseptic, right? So you would clean the rim of your glass, so you put that lime on there because no one washed their glasses back in the oh, day either, right? Of like, course not. Yeah, again, going back to of course not. how did we survive? And then, you know, probably you probably serve a drink to John Bob, John Bob <laughs> yeah. left, and then use the same glass to yeah. serve Billy Bob. Uh -huh. Yep, and then all the the people were like the pirates and the and all the royalty on the ships, you know, they were all getting the scurvy, so they started with all that. They had limes that were yeah. going all around the world, so everyone could get a lime, you know, basically because of all the maritime drinkers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I went to to um, to Cuba and I got to go and get real real mojitos. <laughs> oh, 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 beautiful, beautiful country, and beautiful people. And I kind of went down the rabbit hole where I was looking up the mojito histories, and it was starting off where when the royalty came in on the ships yeah they all had their scurvy and they had their limes but they found the mint yeah. and apparently it was the way to cure i forgot which disease it was but there was some disease going on, on the island where the, they considered the booze and the lime and the mint was literally curing people and they were telling okay. people that was medicine okay and then that's i guess how they got to the u.s from there nice <laughs> I'm going to smoke mine, too. Cool. And so what's your favorite chip to use for this, like applewood or something else? Or it, it depends. I think I find myself normally doing cherry wood um, just as a personal preference. But I try eh, flying chips. Right, my motor needs to be lubed up at some point <laughs> but um yeah if if it's like a rye i feel maybe more like, like a hickory or not not a fruity one um is probably more appropriate where if i'm doing sweeter or more neutral flavored ones then i can get okay. to more of that feel like fruity Ooh, big in my eyes <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm still curious what the building, the rest of the building is like, what is going on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going with the orange too. And as you can see, I'm also doing it over the glass as well. That way I can get 
any zest I can get off of that. So why like not actually cut a piece of orange off and put the orange in there? You could. And okay. some people do. do. Okay. And it's interesting. Cheers. Or Nostrovia. Oh, <laughs> mm. It takes the bite off too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like that little edge where you're just like, ooh. Um wait, I got a beard. What'd you ask me? Um why come people don't like <laughs> how come you just don't put a piece of orange in there versus just a peel? Oh. Uh, I feel on the north side of America, we like to taste like a little more just spirit forward. Again, again, especially in the Pacific Northwest, I feel like it is pretty much more of a shot. We barely put anything yeah. else in. Yeah, uh, It's a more popular in the south to actually have muddled oranges mm -hmm. and cherries in. And usually they do take a muddle. It's very, very Florida-esque. Um, didn't come across it as much in Texas, but I know... A lot of my friends in, in the Florida area, Georgia area, have gotten the muddled. And then um, it's just their preference. And I have had people ask me, can I have a muddled orange okay. at my bottom? It's very rare. Very, very rare. Maybe once every three years. But uh, So what's the difference between like a regular bourbon and a rye bourbon? So so rye, you you have, you know, you're more, uh, what do we have over here? So this is. This is actually regular root yeah. but when I bought it, it was a rye, but now it's regular. But the bottle, when I bought it, it was a rye. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you, this one's 100% rye. So your rye mash uh, has to be rye, which is going to be, um, you'll notice a more drier taste to it. But if you think about like rye bread, it, it's it's got a specific taste. You know what? Right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I never thought about yeah. that. Yeah, so it's the rice yeah. seeds, and okay. they're just mashing yeah. it I up. I never thought about that, yeah. And then your bourbon um, can be the mash, but you have to have less than 50% rye okay. if you're mixing it. Um, and then Canada doesn't have any laws on what's rye, what's whiskey, what's bourbon. So whiskey technically is only from Tennessee, just like champagne is technically only from France. Yeah. So everything else is supposed to be a bourbon. Technically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So when you go to Canadian whiskey, you can put whatever you want in there uh, in ratios where rye you have to have, it has to be heavy rye. Okay. Um, and again, it, bourbons tend to be smoother and sweeter where ryes are a little more harsher. Yeah. I have some friends that only drink rye. Uh, like I'll drink it. I'm not a big fan. Like I suppose I went to a bar and said, hey, here's a drink for you. It's like old fashioned with like some kind of rye. Uh -huh. I, I'm not going to tear it down. Of course, right, you right. know, but. I'm not gonna. I'm not. I'm, I'm not gonna order it myself. Yeah. Yeah. You know your reference and yeah. preference. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like you know, you get a Manhattan. If you think about it, you're putting sweet vermouth in it, so you're actually evening out the rye that you're putting in. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that always was a great way to go. Cause why? Yeah. Cause if, but if you do it in the right way and the right balance, you're fine. But a lot of Manhattans I get is just so much sweet vermouth that you lose the rye. So why are you paying for something like this? Um, that is a little more intricate and regulated and then all of a sudden now you're just putting a bunch of other stuff okay. in it so if you like the rye taste i feel old-fashioned would be a better way to go than a, a manhattan but if you don't and bourbon is great and what's so unique about it is every brand does have a different taste it does yeah it's crazy it is yeah it does yeah and so there's a guy i know uh we're like linkedin linkedin friends so to speak he's out of houston and he showed me a picture of a of his bar right at home is like it has to be at least a thousand bottles of bourbon, right? Like, dude, that is fucking insane. He has like a thousand bottles of bourbon, this big base of refrigerator for cigar humidity. Yeah. Like, dude, like, when can I come vacation to your house, dude? If we could only smoke a cigar in here right now, yeah. oh. I actually, when I got started this, when I got this place from the from the building, I said, hey. Can I smoke in here? Like, no, you can't smoke in here, right? <laughs> right. Like, I don't want to, like, you know, like have a conversation. Yeah. Smoke some cigars, you know, smoke some, you know, the funny stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah. But like, <laughs> I, like, I was trying to figure out how to, how could I get away with it, right? Do I just like lock all the doors, have incense everywhere? Hey, little know? fans. <laughs> yeah. But like, yeah. yeah. Post office right there. They probably oh, yeah. smell it. Yeah. They probably poo poo that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not with the post office. We're literally next door. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then you got the the e cigs, but not the same. Mm -mm. No, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. So, ooh, I I don't know if I've had the Woodenville rye before. So, mm. so this is actually not a rye. So I I bought this bottle like maybe two oh, or three you years put ago. Put it in the bottle. Yeah. So you, when I bought it, I got a personalized bottle with the rye. Uh, then I went and bought it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Your name? Oh. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, what's so the... now that's like regular wooden wheel. Okay, so this is your decanter at this point. Yeah. Gotcha. Basically, yeah, basically, oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, so yeah. What is December 2nd, 2018? What's the... That's the day me and my friend were there. My friend took... Aww. that uh, The wooden wheel, what do you want to call it? They had like a um, pasting, whatever. A pasting room, yeah. Yeah, and they said, okay, which one you like? We... And actually, um, the one I liked they had ran out, and so we just got this one. Very nice. Yeah. The fact that they etched it, that's amazing. Yeah, it was very nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd keep that as my decanter. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> Fantastic. And again, yeah, once you smoke this, it changes the flavor profile oh, yeah. and what it is. So you, Definitely. You could, you could have told me it was right. I believed it. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone's like taste palette is different, right? Mm -hmm. How does that like, um, so I guess some taste palettes are like more sweeter, more or, mm -hmm. or like is that like scientifically proven or is it like i don't know yeah. i mean like people, at least we can say personal preference yeah personal preference yeah um i used to work in a speakeasy and speakeasies don't don't have menus uh and you can still you know order the, the classic speakeasy that you think of uh you know old-fashioned aviations etc but um because back in the day you couldn't have a menu you couldn't have any you know uh, evidence of you serving booze so you would be like one is what did you have in stock you don't know what barrel drink you would be getting and then you don't know what drinks like mixers you would have back in the day but what you would do is ask hey do you like a spirit forward or do you like a little mask you know so a lot of people are like i don't want to taste the booze i get that a lot actually yeah. especially with the younger crowd yeah. let's let's sweet that i can't taste the booze i'm like okay here's a blue drink <laughs> um, <laughs> um so you ask that, you ask, do you like it floral? Do you like citrus? Do you like sweet? Do you like sour? Do you like dark liquor, light liquor? Do you have a preference on even the liquor itself? And so from there, you find that person's yeah. taste okay. and sense. Um, you, you give them their drink, they take the risk. That's the whole point because you're taking a risk going to a speakeasy, you know, yeah. in the original way, right? Yeah. And if you like it, you get another one. If you don't, they'll find another way to make something else. But that's like one is a great way to, to discover new drinks as a, a consumer. And it's also a really great way as a bartender to be creative and also just figure their own stuff out. Okay. Um, because you, you really are just making something off, off the cuff sometimes. And uh, it's kind of still it's so neat that it's still true to how speakeasies were during prohibition in, in a sense, like we're still holding on to that tradition. So uh, back in September, I went to Vietnam to Saigon with some friends of mine. Ooh. We actually yeah. were just speakeasy in Vietnam. Wow. It was a fucking coolest experience, right? The drinks are so good. They made old fashioned perfectly, right? It was just a it's just a badass experience, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it fucking Especially nice. fun when you yeah, when it's underground. Yeah. Um sometimes you need a password, right? Yeah. It was like it was definitely like going to a dungeon, an underground cave, right. whatever, like are we sure not going to our fucking death right now? Exactly. This not looks safe. <laughs> right. At least you're at least well, at least your downstairs is like a bunker, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and um I know here in Seattle. Uh, bathtub gin especially but a lot of other speakeasies as well they do full free pours which means there's no pour spout mm -hmm. and you actually count just through the bottle itself okay. like just how you pour a bottle and that's a really not amazing way to learn as well just how much uh ounces that you are putting in the drinks it's it's just crazy the the science on it but they they also keep that true because there were no measuring back in the day either have you tried a thing called High West Whiskey out of Utah? Oh, yes. I love them. Yeah, yes, I have that at my bar. It's so yeah. good. Like, mm -hmm. who, who imagined Mormons could make such a good whiskey, right? <laughs> right? No, and their rye, okay, their rye is amazing as well. Is it? I tell them, it, I say, screw, bur um, screw bullet, mm -hmm. go High West. Yeah, yeah High West yeah. is so tasty. Mm -hmm. It's like, man, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it's, it's fucking delicious, yeah. I don't know what they do. <laughs> who, who knows? Because <laughs> Mormons, I don't think they can drink their religion. I could be wrong. Well, to my knowledge, they, they weren't either but i think there are certain sects that yeah it's can, okay yeah. I like you think of utah i mean yeah. you know there's mormons out there drinking yeah. it's just yeah i don't know how many uh, they, they ask them yeah that. definitely true yeah mm -hmm. i mean like those muslims who eat pork you know <laughs> christians you do like unchristian things you know sorry that's right. true but yeah right you're right yeah but see. that that high high west it is delicious it's like yeah okay now you're making <laughs> oh my god I want to <laughs> that is definitely <laughs> delicious yeah um do you want to do a smoke mask call next? Oh, yes. Okay. So I got two more glasses. We'll get... Oh, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise. So we'll, so we'll finish this. I'm still going to chug it. Yay. After my plane ride last night. 
I could use a drink. <laughs> I was on the coldest plane. I was, I was like freezing. So I did not sleep well. So what's in your like, um, I'm pretty sure you have an extensive bar. Like what's like your like um, mainstays in your bar? Like, like as far as bourbons and drinks and stuff, like what do you like your go-to, so to speak? Or... Mm. You mean like, on the business side or at home bar? Oh shit! We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, do, we'll, do, we'll do business side first. Yeah, because again, pr price point. Yeah, um, we're we're trying to keep it, uh, you know, s simple. Uh -huh. Um, and you do still want to kind of go recognizable brands. Some people are just too afraid sometimes to go off. Yeah, like this Frank August. Like I'm sure no one knows what Frank August. I'd right? I'd be very surprised if many people knew yeah. that. Uh, e even there, gosh, like if if someone if it's not if like the rum's not Bacardi. They, they don't know what else to order some, sometimes. Yeah, and, and if people don't realize Bacardi is like, you know, if you go to you know, yeah. uh, the Korean, it's like shit rum, you know? Right, it, it's considered their well. Yeah. And it's, and then it is like, it has an amazing history. It's a great rum. Great story. Um, you know, and, and it is just mass produced, so it is going to be cheaper as well yeah. on that side. And there is no regulation with rums. Rums can also be so just so whatever you put in it. better rums out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I, and I do have a preference on rum, and some people think a lot of silver booze, rum or vodka, like, doesn't have other you know, profiles, but I still find. So this is top of my head. I wonder how come, you know, they never, someone never started like a Jack Sparrow rum. That is actually a good point. And maybe yeah. there is one. I actually, I could almost Google that one. I, there's gotta be somebody. Somebody said, I had to start, I mean, of course you would think Johnny Depp, well, how come Johnny Depp did all the fucking. Yeah, yeah. actually you're right. Yeah. yeah. Johnny Depp needs to have his own. Jack, everyone else is doing the Dan tequilas. A Jack Sparrow rum. Mm-hmm. Now I I can say like so so this mezcal here, they're trying to get into the U.S. So just again with laws and distributions, yeah. I can't imagine the red tape these some of these oh, people are trying to get through. Yeah. Um, so maybe there is one, but maybe they only do it in the Caribbean and we just maybe can't so, get yeah. it in the U.S. Yeah, and it's, that is hard hardest part, especially as a bartender that does travel sometimes. Like, let's say there's something in, I don't know. Um, Amsterdam. Uh, like, actually, I actually, you know, I'll take a real example. Uh, there's this amazing, uh, it's a birch tree liqueur from Iceland. Okay. And you can only get it there. It's really cheap. It's like twenty dollars yeah. a bottle. But they have the actual oak leaves in in the bottle, just kind of seeping up, and it's so delicious. It's the coolest thing. Yes, it kind of does taste like you're licking a tree, but I do like that taste. <laughs> I'm from Chicago. I love Malort. Um, so that says a lot about me. <laughs> um, so I would love to put this amazing, it's, it's, it's such a smooth, almost bourbon-esque, uh, but it's technically considered a schnapps. And I, I can't get it here. Yeah. There's no way. I mean, of course, you know, those laws to keep stuff out of the country, I understand that. But some of the stuff, like when I was in Vietnam, I got big of some mosquitoes, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, my friend's wife's uncle gave me this thing called Tiger Bomb, right? Yes, I love, I and love was, Tiger Bomb. And I was like, oh my yeah. God, this is a good thing. But I got in Thailand, yeah. Yeah, but supposedly you can't bring it over. Even all the greens, so like like natural stuff, we can't, you're not supposed to bring it to the United mm -hmm. States for some reason. Right? Come a lot like, are you kidding me, right? This is like the best thing ever. It, it like, it's like no itchy, no nothing, right? Right. And there is a Tiger Bomb here now, but yeah. I don't think it's the same oh, stuff in there. Way, yeah. yeah, actually, so one of my favorite vodkas is Russian Standard. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, unfortunately, with what's going on now in the world, yeah. we've we've pulled it out and it is what it is. Yeah. But um, when I was traveling, I, I, had gone, I had gone to, I think it was Greece, I had gotten it. And it was a ginseng infused Russian Standard mm -hmm. vodka. Most delicious thing I've ever had. Yeah. But apparently it's not allowed in the U.S. because you're not allowed to have any booze that's considered medicinal advertised. And so I had to give, I remember I had to give it away to one, like one of my Aussie friends. And I'm like, I'm flying out today. Here's the rest of my bottle. I can't even bring this in. I can't yeah. even check it in my luggage. Like, I probably could have gotten away with checking my luggage. But yeah, I mean, you got to take risks. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, oh, I forgot all this in there. <laughs> Oopsie. My, my or I didn't know. Like, I, I just know as a bartender about these weird laws that someone else would have yeah. never known. But I know I couldn't get it at the airport duty free. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's crazy, like the Tiger Bomb, like the United States, like you like, you literally spray ten gallons of stuff in this yeah. itch, and never goes away. It doesn't work at all. Mm -hmm. This like little tiny, tiny piece of Tiger Bomb. Super concentrated. Oh probably. my god! Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's crazy how like uh, so many countries do things better than us, right? Right. And then with all this technology, you 
think there'd be more of a melting pot. Yeah. But once it comes down to money, you know, yeah, yeah. And, all that and who knows what goes up. behind the, the back doors of these large companies. And it's just like, Bobby, I, I have my, my hands, are, my hands are tied. Like, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, but my pay grade, so to speak. Yeah. All right, let me get this two glasses Ooh, over yes. Here. All right. I'll get some more wood prepped here. Now, again, I'm not sure how applewood will taste with this mezcal. So we are going to be guinea pigs on this. Yeah. And again, it's, it's just a fun learning experience. And I can't imagine it not working out. I just love booze. Yeah. <laughs> so, but... and, and for those of you watching, if you want the full effect of alcohol, do a nine-day fast first, <laughs> nine-day water fast first, and have, have, have a drink. And I sure haven't eaten yet either. So last night when I got off my plane at 9 p.m. was the last time I had a sandwich. <laughs> Yeah. So what's the difference between mezcal and tequila? So when you have your gut, so tequila is kind of the same as, again, the champagne. Uh, it has to be in certain regions of Mexico where um, mezcal or agave spirits, is, which is also the way people get around it. Um, you, can, you can do it in, in other places, other towns. And... Uh, uh, mezcals are smoke like a, it's like a, the bourbon of tequilas I don't like to say and they what they do because I when I went I actually went to one of the farms mm -hmm. and gaves they take tw some of these take 25 years to grow that's like a plant right yeah it's like a cactus yeah it, yeah it's uh, so so agave you'll see it on a lot of bottles Meh, this one you can't see quite as well so it's it has these staves like a pineapple stave like it's like a pineapple basically yeah so they actually call it a pina okay. so but it's larger so it's like a one kilo size plant that can take up to 25 years or more just depends on the uh the type of agave plant you're you're putting in and i have a video of myself axing one and this thing is ginormous so it's the pina part so the, the part that looks like the pineapple but it doesn't have a taste like a pineapple and you, you chop people do it by hand they're chopping it by hand and then they put in this big pit and they smoke it and that's where you get that smoky flavor where a lot of other places just mash it and it goes from the mash to um turn, you know turning into the, the alcohol and distilling where this one takes those extra steps to smoke it cook it um they flip it and uh Holy cow, like the taste is amazing. And again, it doesn't quite matter where it's coming from, mm -hmm. in a sense, because there's certain elevations that have certain tequilas and there's certain elevations that have mezcals. So that's another beast that you could break down you know, later. Uh, so this me mezcal I had gotten at, at the farm that I had gone to, and there's tons of flavors in, between the different agave plants. And what's really cool is there was, there was one, I don't remember the name, it was named after a Polish guy. So it was like Zerwinski. <laughs> it was actually really funny because they have, you have the, like the little. That's so, random. That's so yeah. random. Yeah. And I remember like, well, this doesn't look like it's Spanish. <laughs> uh, okay. So apparently that particular one had a minty flavor. And I actually have one of those too. And that one, I, I wouldn't turn an old fashioned. It's more just a sipper. It really does taste like mint. This one, because it has the worm in it, um, it gives you like an extra umami feel and almost. I'm not sure if sweet is technically the right word, but it definitely changes to not, you're not just getting the smoky feel. There's something in the back. I, I can't really explain. Maybe you'll figure it out um, when I make these, but. Let me make yours first. Oh, no, okay. So does mezcal and tequila only come from Mexico? Yes. Okay. That I, that at least that I know of. I'm, okay. um, I don't even think you're allowed. Uh, tequila, you're not allowed for sure. Um, mezcal, maybe you can kind of get away with it outside, but if you do make quote unquote tequila, you have to call an agave spirit. You're not okay. allowed to call it tequila. Okay. So there are people in California that make it and then it's just called, uh, agave spirit. Okay. So I don't know if you want to smell mine, um, beforehand, just not a whole lot to it, but what's nice. It's, it's not like when you get a tequila and you get that weird nose and you're just like, Ooh, college. <laughs> no, like, no, like bad things about to happen. <laughs> Did you ever do like 
the too many Patron shots or too many Jaegers or any, is there any like booze you ever had? You're like, I can't do this again. Cause I went oh. way, way too hard on it. Okay. Here's an interesting story. <laughs> so my younger days, right. Um, I drunk off, I got drunk off wild turkey one time. Right. Oh. And like yeah. to this day, the smell of it that I, I can't take it. Right. <laughs> I, I, I wild turkey. Right. And so like, I can't smell it. I can't look at it. If I see the wards wild turkey, I get sick. Right. Yeah. So fast forward. So I used to go deep sea fishing every and I've told this story before on the Ooh. podcast. I used to go deep sea fish every year. So one year I went with my couple of friends, my son. And so, you know, you got to be there West Park at five in the morning, the signing stuff, the boat leaves at six, right? Of course, everyone has a little coolers and stuff with drink sandwiches, right? And so these two dudes, they have to be in the 60s, 70s, right? And you can just you just tell like they lived the whole life in the sea, right? But they were like, they look sea. Yeah. Right? And they had this, they had this big ass cooler, right? They put the cooler on the boat. And by 6.30, that one old guy told the other old guy, hey, can we get started now? Well, shit, we should have started pretty soon as we woke up. I'm surprised we waited this long, right? These motherfuckers broke out a gallon of fucking raw turkey. A fucking gallon. And, <laughs> and they had a case of shape for life. Oh, gosh. And it gets better. But wait, there's more. <laughs> These motherfuckers. Finished it all by they started at six thirty, done at seven thirty. No. Yes. I don't know the reason you knew because the captain came to him and said, "Hey, all your trash you put in the trash can. You need to put it somewhere else because this is for like everyone else, right?" And so, empty gallon of water turkey, twenty four empty straight food cans. We're like, "Oh my god!" Of course, I'm I'm done, right? I'm fucking sick as shit. Oh. I, I have to go lay in the bed, right? And like my my trip's fucked. But of course, I get up once in a while. And so, of course, there's a limit on like salmon fishing. Let's say pay post post us. We had a limit of 100. They were the fish versus. They caught 95 of the 100 fishes. Wow. It, it was like the fish was jumping up. They just knew. Yeah, it's like the fish was jumping up to them, right? <laughs> They're sweating the booze out of them, probably. Yeah. And it's like, and it's like, Jesus, party is over it's here. It's like, <laughs> talk about functional alcoholics, right? It was like, <laughs> and they were talking, joking around, no stumbling. Functioning. Yeah, like the wards were not slurred. <laughs> like, I mean, it's like, they, I mean, if they got put over, like driving a car, mm -hmm. of course they took the breathalyzer, they were failed, <laughs> but they said, hey, do these, all these agility tests and speaking, uh -huh. like, you know, um, say alphabet backwards. Exactly, yeah. They back perfectly, right? No problem. Yeah, I got this. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, like to this day, I'm fucking weird, like dumbfounded, like, oh my God. I, I have known a few people that really can do it. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. like, like fucking a gallon and a case of Schaefer. So, so, so I, I don't know. I don't know what's worse, the case, of the the gallon of wild turkey or the case of Schaefer. I, it's like, okay, first you have the turkey, okay, but then you're like putting this weird layer that does it float or does it sink yeah. inside or does it just like do this swirl inside your stomach? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, this viscosity yeah, like, like, what, what the fuck is inside yeah. your stomach? Like, god damn. You just like, got foam on top. Like, fucking, <laughs> you have like nothing but acid in there, like killing all the alcohol and shit, yeah. you know. Hey, you know, if you had any bacteria, yeah. it's gone now. I, I, You're done. I, I know you You're have cured. No, I know you have no liver. Yeah, yeah, right. Your liver. <laughs> two of them, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's like, man, I tell the story a lot on the podcast. It's like, the it's interesting. Like, just the fuck, like, just the the look at everyone's face, like, the, like, what the fuck? It's like everyone on the boat, like, what the fuck is on the right now, right? They're drinking shots, and then, and of course, we're looking like the smells horrible. They're having a good time talking, talking about old fishing stories, right? You know, everyone's laughing, like. What the fuck is going on right now? Is this real? Ooh. Yeah. I was like, I have to go to work later today, so we're gonna see how I function. <laughs> oh, I did bring a special bitters too. Okay. So normally, if I make a mezcal old fashioned, because mezcal can be a little strong, uh -huh. you mix it maybe like one third to two thirds actually tequila, mm -hmm. and then you put a little chocolate bitters in it because what's better than like Oaxaca? So I mean, so mezcal technically is Oaxacan. Okay. Um. I, if there is anything on the outside edges, I just don't know my knowledge, but it might exist. But specifically, Oaxaca really is where the mezcal's at. Okay. And Mexican, I don't know if you have Mexican chocolate before. No. So Mexican chocolate has spices, like little bits of pepper and yeah, red, you have red pepper, black pepper, some cinnamon. And if you get a Mexican hot chocolate anytime, highly recommend. Um, so typically like, so, so I'm actually going to Mexico January 23rd or 29th to visit my friend that lives down there. And what's it, what's even better? 
he owned he 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 opened up a he opened up a bar up down there. Oh, you're gonna have such a good time! I'm so jealous. And it's a, it's a, and a, so he lives a uh, 30 miles east of um that tourist place, Puerto Puerto Vallarta. Por, yeah, Puerto 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 Vallarta. Yeah. Vallarta. I can never can never say it either. Yeah, I can never say it either. Yeah. So I did mine without the ice cube on this one. Okay. Did I put one dash of chocolate just to smooth it out a bit? I don't know if you want to try that. But I can make yours with some ice and just do the regular old fashion again. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Make it however you want to. Yeah. We can compare so, notes. So another <laughs> another drinking story. So when I was in the army, when I first joined the army, I was like 18, 19 years old. And me and my friend Kyoki, like Kyoki is like still more, one of my best friends to this day. And so we were stationed in, in um Gibblestock. And so one time me, him, and this other guy, I can't remember his name. We drove up to Saxon House. It's like basically like the sixth street of, of, of Breckenford, uh -huh. right? And so we just find this club, right? And the three of us are drinking, right? Back then it was, it was Dutch marks. We each spent 150 Dutch marks on Jägermeister, right? We took $150. I think it's like maybe $75 back then, you know? Yeah. And so we basically like drunk Jägermeister from like 8 p.m. to like 11 p.m., right? I mean, like, I gave myself. We both went and got more money, right? And drunk some more. And so we're drinking all night long. We're fucking, we're drunk as shit. And actually, and actually, actually, my friend Alan came with us for two, right? But Alan went to go visit his girlfriend and said, we'll meet, you know, in the car at like three in the morning, right? Alan, <laughs> Alan told us, even though I know the car was that, I knew it was y'all. I, I could smell the alcohol from like a mile away. <laughs> okay. So did you end up getting the Jaeger out of the tap, out of the balls? Have you seen any of those? No, no. I haven't done it either, but I've seen them. And apparently they make, uh, they do this with beer too in Europe sometimes too, because they put one tap that's chilled and one tap that's not. So one for the international people, usually the Americans, <laughs> they want it cold. It definitely, yeah. And then they're like, yeah. no, there's just yager, just you just do it right, right? It's straight. <laughs> so do they, I, I haven't been to that city. I've only been in the south side of Germany and, and Dusseldorf and that's about it. So do they... Uh, drink the beer warm or cold in cold. that city. Cold. Yeah, okay. Cold, yeah, yeah. Man, if only one way they could make make real German beer over here. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was stationed in Germany for the first time for two years, like I was in 18, 19, drink whatever. I came back to the States for like vacation. I'm like, and like, it's not exaggeration. <laughs> I got back with my friends. I literally drank a case of Budweiser by myself, right? Oh, just to get your beer water in? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it was like, fuck, this is some bullshit right here. What the fuck is this, right? Like, oh my God, you're alcoholic, Jason. No, dude, this is fucking piss water. You, like, you have no idea what real beer tastes like. Sometimes, like, you just want to go, when you go back home, you're just like, I just want to go to McDonald's and get my American McDonald's. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> or just, yeah, you just need that at home you do. feeling when you do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're just going to sit for a oh, little. Okay. Woohoo. Oh, yeah, I'm already feeling it. <laughs> so what's in your personal bar uh yeah usually it's 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 items around the world that i can't get that's that's typically what i do because again one nice thing about being in the industry we call it the homie hookup um we're allowed to give away ship drinks okay. so like usually when you work at a bar you get like maybe the drink or two or you get three drinks or you get like a hey fifty dollars worth for the week depending on where you work you can give away certain amounts or if you're a regular, hey, you had four beers, your fifth beer's on me. So certain places are allowed to do that. So when you're in the industry, again, it's kind of the same theory where the whole tipping money is just like floating around, never actually getting used. It's kind of the same. We give our shifties out mm -hmm. to each other. So if someone else, if I'm working and let's say you're coming in from your bar that just closed and you come and see me, I'm going to give you my shifty drink. And um, it's just a the nice little community treat i guess to say and it's really nice that bar owners and restaurant owners uh, probably not corporate um i haven't worked <laughs> in a corporate i don't know i've never worked in a corporate bar but um they probably give you like discounts and stuff but uh yeah. is there like a bar look as a bar certain name bar or die bar or some location you want to bartend at that i know of um, I do want to open my own bar. I actually did put a bid in recently, but unfortunately it's, it's really rough out there. Uh, they ended up paying sticker price 
So even the price I was even going for was apparently they couldn't even counter with me because this other person just swooped in and said, outright, I'll buy it. Like I'll rent it. Um, so my goal is to have my own bar. Uh, there are some really cool bars in Dubai, oh, which is really interesting. And you can get in there. It's, it's a little more challenging, especially as a woman. Um, and then because a lot of Dubai locals don't drink, so you're going to get, you're just kind of catering to tourists. All the international tourists. Yeah. So, but your budget is like way up here to but do you know, really amazing things. But you things. know the tourists have big money though. Exactly. And you have to be eccentric, you creative, you, you have to look good. At, now with Instagram, especially you, all, all your Dubai stuff there. Like, yeah. You, know, yeah, you got to yeah. have something very you gotta unique. You got to be outlandish. Exactly. You some crazy stuff like. We have live pink flamingos walking around or, you know, some crazy shit. A penguin. Yeah. Penguin serves your drink at yeah, this most, point. Yeah. Yeah. Penguin serves your drink. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I think that would be fun and um, like a challenge too. like how outlandish could, could I go? And then how outlandish, like also, how do you top it without ruining the integrity of a cocktail? And that is a hard balance to find too and not make it, you know, you hear about tourist spots, right? So, and you hear about frozen drinks, blue drinks, there's certain cocktails and now people start to think oh that's just vacation drinks mm -hmm. and you, you so you don't want to get too much on that side either uh it, i'm assuming if you're going to dubai i feel like you kind of want to do both um i mean you see ice cream with gold flakes on it that is again the, not going to affect the, the taste the, the of the ice cream the vending machines with yeah. gold bricks in it you know yeah people driving around with the mercedes the fucking the tiger, police tiger, i think tiger, own tiger Ferraris. yeah 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 so then, but there's that, that gold flaked ice cream better tastes damn good if I'm spending $3,000 on a yeah. scoop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think that'd be a challenge, but yeah, if it, I want to open it. I want to open up a place. Okay. Yeah. Um, any certain in neighborhood you want to open up there in Seattle? I mean, I love this Pioneer Square area. Uh, we're going to have the World Cup. It's going to be a fun time. Man, I, I, I mean, I, mad. I got to get tickets there. I got to get tickets. Oh there. I'm not a big soccer fan. I got to get it's, it, Yeah. It, it, I think it doesn't matter. Yeah. It, yeah. It's going to be just like amazing Pine, people. You know, like Pioneer Square is an interesting place, right? Like, so example, I, I'll tell a story. So when I was trying to find a new place, my pocket, because I used to do my podcast in spaces a couple blocks away, but I had, it was like maybe a hundred square feet and they increased my rent from a thousand to two thousand a month. Like I'm not paying this shit. This mm -hmm, is mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. So I, I was trying to find a new place, right? And my guy who's a real estate, he, hey, check this place out in Pioneer Square. Salud. Cheers, my friend. <laughs> Take this place to find a square, right? And say, and he said, keep open mind. So first time I went there, and like all this, you know, I, for lack of a better, all the riffraff was around. Like, dude, I can't do a podcast here. Like, no one's gonna feel safe. All this kind of stuff, you know. Man, said Jason, man, just give it a chance. Come look at. It. I, I came, <laughs> I came in here like, oh my god, this is fucking perfect, right? The brick wall, you know, like it's fucking perfect, right? These walls, I can't imagine how old they are. I know. And I had to look it up because I actually worked underground because in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Kids at home again. <laughs> Chicago Fire. Uh, yeah. You had the first floor and you had to build it's, up. It's same crazy. exact story it's here. It's crazy how many cities are like that. Right? The, the, the fires just reset to something. Uh, one, that's probably uh, an, an engineer's dream for one, because then oh, they yeah. can reset everything, right? Reset everything, yeah. Um, but yeah, just the history and it's still there. But I had to look up the the lime calcium buildup that's going on, you can't get rid of it. It just no. apparently comes with age and it just crumbles, but it's just so neat that it, you can't, it hasn't been changed. And yeah. it's that has been there before I was born for you. Probably you're born. Oh, like yeah, it, definitely. Yeah. It, it, and so Kim look at place. I mean, like this is like 387, almost 400 square feet. They want like 545, you know, like 545 versus 2,400 square feet. It's like, okay. My guests gotta fucking suck it up. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Right? And it's an interesting neighborhood. Like next door to us, like a really good Korean restaurant. Mm -hmm. There's a decent Italian restaurant. There's all these nice places to eat at, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, during the summertime, they do like live uh, music every weekend. Yeah. They did like a Christmas something. So while you were gone, they did like a. Um, oh, yeah, a, the ice skating rink. I ice skating rink mm -hmm. and had like a bunch of like boots set up for holiday, buy holiday stuff, yeah. you know. There's always cool stuff going on. And of course, like, there's, you know, and then, you know, well, I want to tell us like this gospel mission right here, right? Mm -hmm. but then, then like, you know, have you drug free, get in there, you know, it's it's different things, you know. So you just but one thing with me, maybe it's me, like none of them have been aggressive. Like no one's like done anything to me, right? Yeah. So I just walk by, you know. 
of course, like, uh, yeah, actually, last night, this guy was in the streets, like, fucking, like, yelling and stuff, you know, talking to tree, you know, but it's it's definitely an interesting place. Pioneer Square is definitely a good place. My goodness, yes. And I think one thing, so I actually live and also work down here, too. Mm -hmm. And I find it's quiet. Now, of course, it's a little more quiet because everyone's not back in the office still. Yeah. There's still plenty of people doing their at home. So it is a little more dead here now, yeah. which will probably pick up for another year. But it's such a small community. Yeah. It's tight. It's I feel, yeah. yeah, I feel like I live in a great Mayberry. At the yeah. same time, I'm yeah. still in a dingy, eclectic, yeah. it's underground. It's definitely grimy, yeah. 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 Like a, a couple of times, you know, I spend the night here, you know, because I'm working uh -huh. and stuff. And I, I didn't want to drive home. Like I wake up and I go like I saw in three in the morning. It's like fucking nothing. Yeah. Like, like no homeless people. Nothing's out. Not a bird. You walk Local around. <laughs> you walk around walking the water. Yeah. It's, it's definitely an interesting neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? It's yeah, it, it, it's good. You're right. And then you have like the like Taylor's Fish. I think it's called Taylor's Fish House Restaurant down the road, you know, the different coffee shops, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, the stadium is like worth the walking distance, you know. Yeah, and it's so amazing how the city comes alive when there's an event. Oh, yeah. It's just a complete switch to, like, yeah. nothing, to crowded streets. People from all over the world come in. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, yeah. one time I did a podcast on a Saturday in the one morning. Like, oh, shit, I uh, kind of fucked up. Um, there's a, a Sounders game right now, so oh. uh, you might want to come, like, right now to park or like, uh, mm -hmm. figure something else out, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I street park still. Cause I street park. I'm thankful. Okay, one nice thing about the, the whole pandemic is... Again, no one coming to work. So I'm still finding street parking. I haven't actually had to rent my garage mm -hmm. in four years now, yeah. I think, three years. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do the street parking. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, of course, I play the parking street. We'll let yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> play the parking game. Yeah. Oh, you God. Know, I play the parking game. And, like, I've had a couple of tickets. So of course, I've got paid. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't, you know. It's probably not a good thing to say. Yeah. But, like. No, I got a boot and, recently. And when you, <laughs> and when you think about it, the, uh, the, the parking rate in the street is not fucking crazy expensive either, you know. No. I at the most I think it's sixteen dollars a day by the time you actually yeah. play the game and switch switch sides of the roads and all that. Yeah. 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 And one thing's crazy, like if you like call on the phone, like suppose you do parking for like eight to ten and you use a phone, you cannot park here no more. Yeah. But so but if, you know the secret. Yeah. But if you just put the car <laughs> in the machine, you get to keep the car there and go on and on. Right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> I keep thinking about the Seinfeld episode mm -hmm. where yeah they hired was it Kramer and he had yeah. to switch the yeah. the cars back and forth across yeah. the street and it's like it's the same cars we just need to just go on the other side of the street. <laughs> yeah, it's I don't know if it's the same, right? And of course, you know, so this is kind of random, right? So one time, um, one time I was like like by Pike Place Market, right? Mm -hmm. And I walked from here from Pike Place Market here, right? This one day, I mean, absurd, it's totally random, right? I walk. I think I was walking down First Avenue, and I walked past four parking ticket people, right? Yep. But no, I know some of them by name now. But but, <laughs> but 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 no fucking police. And you see all these people fighting, doing you no know, stuff, right? Like, what the yeah. fuck? So you, you're you more concerned about giving people tickets versus, like, you know, having police or taking care yeah, of the Yeah, you know? I know. But they don't make money off of it. Oh, of course yeah. not. Those are fun things. Yeah, I know. It's such a struggle. And yes, we need the money. We need some improvements. But we need to find that balance between justice and money. And yeah, the pandemic really with the whole we, we can talk. That's a whole nother story. But again, you're trying to find that balance. And it's still I don't see anything coming together for until probably the cup. Honestly, yeah. they they know they will get their stuff together. That, the cup. that looking I'm, forward to it. For, I mean, just like many reasons. Remember how the Major League Baseball All-Star game? Mm -hmm. They cleaned everything. Yep. And, and then we, Taylor Swift the next week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One thing I thought was kind of fucked up was like. They asked for volunteers, right? Like, are you, that was so fucked up. Like, you want volunteers to do your fucking job? Like, we're paying, yeah. all, we're paying all these high taxes. You want volunteers to clean up? I thought, I thought that was bullshit. I know, because what's minimum wage here now? Sixteen twenty-five. Sixteen twenty-five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, really? <laughs> so you couldn't afford sixteen twenty-five and a free lunch, maybe? A little box lunch or something? Yeah, that's yeah. bullshit, you know. Of course, the criticism, oh, we cleaned up just for this event, yeah. you know? Of course, you can't present the major league all star game and you know like hope go all this fucking yeah. crap, right? Yeah, I don't know if you heard about the San Francisco one when the uh, you know yeah when, when, when that that uh, the, Asian Asian conference came yeah here. yeah and the the Chinese uh, yeah it was kind of I, I mean I, I admire his honesty it was kind of fucked up when the governor said yes mm. we cleaned it up just for this we literally swept under the rug yeah yes 
and yes. we put as much under the rug as we could. Yes, we cleaned this for this event. Yeah. yeah. And I saw photos because they had uh, all these fencing. I don't know if did you see photos? Yeah. Yeah. And all these fencing, and there's just nobody out there. And if you've ever been to San Francisco, uh, we know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, Seattle's pretty hardcore too, but mm. San Francisco is a whole nother beast. Oh, yeah. It's a different <laughs> level. Yeah. Well, people in Seattle, you haven't seen nothing go to San Francisco. 100%. Yeah. So another good story. So first time I'm going to San Francisco, I was there doing some business and I caught the BART train for the first time. Right. Mm -hmm. So I caught the BART from um, San Francisco down South. Right. Yeah. And so on the BART, I heard a horror story. So I'm like, I kind of prepared. Right. This dude. Right. So you, you know, when you're a little kid, you played like in the mud and stuff. Uh -huh. Oh, and then, no. And then like the sun dried it all, kicked in into you. Right. This dude looked like that from foot to toe. So he's like a clay statue at this yeah, point. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, the story gets better. No shoes. Oh. It's a, only it has a sleeping bag. Is no he sleep. wearing the sleeping bag or he's, is he holding a sleeping the bag? The sleeping bag is wrapped around him. Okay, right. it's wearing him. Around, okay. around his middle part. Right? <laughs> okay. So I, I probably has no, no clothes on all right. And he's asking people, can you give me a dollar? I'm like, dude. Like, I didn't say this out loud. Yeah, like, yeah. Dude. You need more than a fucking yeah, dollar. You need more than a dollar, right? You need someone like invest a year of the life in you, right? Yeah, yeah. And first of all, like, how do you even get on the train, right? And then it's like he, he walked uh, back and forth. Like, I saw him walk by like, three or four times, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's my first day in San Francisco. Oh, first day. Oh, wow. First day. First day, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is it, it's different down here, right? Yes. I have luckily had a really great time. Because there are a lot of trade shows in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So I've luckily been pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I love San Francisco. Like, you know, Candlestick, you know, the Golden State uh -huh. Park, you know, Christmas Wharf. Uh -huh. I love, man, I love Christmas Wharf. It's also Bartender's Paradise because all those bars are so old. Yeah, I love Christmas um, Wharf. I actually, so my my bar dream, there's a place called the Black Horse. It is my favorite bar in the entire world. Mm -hmm. Entire world. I'm, and I've been in a lot of places. Uh, they are the smallest bar, according to them, uh, west of the Mississippi. I want to say it's nine to 12 bar seats. Okay. And I think the fire code is like 23 or something. Okay. Okay. It is literally the size of this. The bar is the size of this table, right? And then we have people here. You're the bartender. A tiny little bathroom under these stairs that go up to an apartment. A very small little back room, and then you can kind of stand behind some people. Yeah. Um, the bartender and the owners are like amazing people. And here's a great part of the history of the Black Horse. White Horse up here, he's the original owner. Oh shit! And then he opened nice. the White Horse here, okay. um, sold sold his business, and I, I love to pick his everybody's brains yeah. because again, that's kind of part of my dream is I want a tiny yeah. little bar like this. But here's what's so cool again about history and. It's not really speakeasy, but there, they, there's no plumbing technically until, until you get to the bathroom area. Mm -hmm. So there's literally a bathtub of ice in okay. behind the bar where they put all the beer. Okay. They have one of those manual pump for one keg, oh, a wow. special whatever you have. <laughs> they have a charcuterie board that usually sells out in the first like two to three hours. Otherwise, you order pizza in, you bring in your own stuff, and there's no cell phones allowed. Oh, you have to be social. Nice. The only thing you're allowed to use your cell phone for is if you're talking and I'm like, hey, I got to look up something with Google or otherwise we're going to get into an argument or take a picture. Nice. If you've got to talk, you go outside. You don't, you're not on your phone. You, you get the fuck out. Nice. Can I all do that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yay! Um, and it, it's just such a, a, like, again, an eclectic group of people. Mm -hmm. Not only there, but just all the bars. Yeah. But I specifically make sure I go there every time yeah. because you feel like family because they have, they're going to get to know you. And then anyone else you meet on the patron side, you're going to have a good time. You feel like you're in Europe, you know, and as a, a, a one girl alone, right? Like I, I travel alone all the time. Mm -hmm. And so being able to go somewhere where I'm comfortable, yeah, I know I'm not going to get like stalked or something, right? Like, Th that's a place. Yeah, that's that's, and, that's and, important. Yeah, and San Francisco in general, when you go to these bars, are a lot just friendly, awesome people who've been doing it for many, many years. Yeah, yeah I'm a big fan <laughs> of the Bay Area. So one time, so my niece lives there. She lives in a town called Antioch. I go for a while. So one time we went to, mm -hmm. to Christmas Wharf. It was just some kind of bar restaurant, Christmas Wharf. 
like, no, let's, let's stop in, have a quick drink with Lee, right? And it's like a, it was like, I hate, I don't want to say it's a girly drink, but it's like a, it's like a tall glass like this. Mm-hmm. It's like different, almost like a pina colada or something like that, right? Remember, we talked about touristy drinks. Yeah, yep. it, 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 <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it's definitely a touristy drink. And we were both drunk and we look at each other and like we're both at the same time, we cannot leave this place. Like, we have to drink this until we're like, we're fucking like done, right? It was so fucking good. Like, we cannot, it was like, this is, I can say, this is bad to say, it's like, tastes like the greatest sex you ever had, right? It was, it was, it was, so, it was so good, right? It's an orgasm in your mouth. Yeah. I, mean. that's what it was. About that. Like, I told my niece, Destiny, we can't leave this. <laughs> Uncle Jason, yes, I don't leave either. Oh. We're going to drink this forever, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's what I love. Okay, San Francisco and also Pike Place, like mm-hmm. both of those fishermen areas, right? Yes, they're touristy, but all the locals still go there. Yeah, Because they exactly. know it's still quality. It's quality. It's High not quality, yeah. forced upon. No. In like some other places, you're like, yeah, we write pina colada, right? And uh, it's just that focus. Mm-hmm. And this one, you know that that drink was probably an original, yep. true like made with love recipe yeah they're not just like uh these people just drink whatever like they made it with a care yeah and that's what's so nice about that san francisco area yeah but just like here there's all the other extracurricular stuff going on right yeah (laughs) you don't get bored that's for sure one time i went there one time and i went to like a some kind of like a deli restaurant or whatever this dude walked in and just said uh and just start stealing stuff right hey you can't do that what the Mm. fuck you gonna do Call the police. Yeah. Call the police. Ha ha ha. ha. Cuss them out. Stole shit. Walked out. Damn, dude. Like, how can you stay open, right? Yeah. That's a shame. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I need to go visit my niece again. And where's she at? Uh, Antioch. Down in Stamford, oh, yes. Right yes. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a cool place. Of course, all the fucking money's down there, too, right? It's like all the invest money, all the VCs. It's crazy. Like, I think someone I did look at uh, this little 3.5 mile error. Is worth more than every country in the world. Yet there's still the tenderloin. The, yep. The tenderloin still exists. Yep. And it, I don't think it's changed much. No. And it's just amazing. And hope, hopefully, we have, again, same with Seattle, and we can get into politics. Like, that's a whole other thing, but we just took some of that money and put it in there. Yeah. What could we change, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk politics? I'll talk a little. I'll talk a little. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we want, what do you want to talk about first? Well, okay. This actually is rolling into the whole, have, have you heard about the Colorado thing where they're giving everybody $1,000 that's homeless and a house? They give them $1,000 a month and a house. I haven't heard that. So apparently, I want to say maybe four months, maybe six months. I'm not quite sure, but it's not like a year old yet, this program. And it's a test program. Everyone in Colorado. Uh, homeless people. Homeless people. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so they'll give $1,000 and, a, and a, like a tiny, tiny home or an apartment. And they're finding that it's almost like a 65 to 85 percent success rate, because that's literally the jump start some of these people course, need. Assuming they're sober. Yeah, of yeah. course, what people jump on is like the 35 percent who fuck it up, right? Right, and it's and unfortunately, it usually just come to sobriety, um, and that's a whole other story that I know the East Coast actually has a fairly successful uh, trend going on there. Well, Colorado, they were first like legalized marijuana, first legalized stuff, you know? yeah, yeah. 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 Like who, who thought uh, of, self-serve beer on tap? Who's yeah. Colorado, all fucking places, right? Right, yeah, middle of middle of nowhere, just windy, dry. But then you go skiing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The 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 uh, blue horse, the blue unicorn, or Pegasus, whatever it is. Yeah. I don't know. I, I didn't think we, we have to experiment with different things, right? Yeah. Like, but but they're showing really good success with that program. Yeah. Nice, nice. I mean, who couldn't use a thousand dollars extra a month? Honestly, I think that would fix even middle class anybody. Like, if, if there was just but okay, pushing back on that, mm-hmm. like a thousand dollars has to come. Of course, like a lot of people think Republicans are like fiscal. Republicans have not been fiscal since before George versus Second, right? Everyone's like, I mean, I think the federal budget has like quadrupled since like yeah. George Bush. Like, yeah. there's no such thing as that, right? And we could also talk about Reagan. Yeah, our, our and, great, our and... great, great grandkids are fucked, right? Yeah. But like, where? I mean, the money has to. Come. Come it's gone from debt spending. I mean, I mean, if you print money off, there's inflation like thousand dollars times all the homeless people. That has to be a lot of money, right? So, so here's what the argument is. Um, supposedly, it's like one point something million dollars to f- just keep people from overdosing and bringing them back. Um, 
like a year, just some extravagant number yeah. I can't even think of right now that is, it isn't a thousand dollars a month. Let's yeah. say it's, it's not $12,000 a year to take care of a homeless person who yeah. is overdosing, who's doing anything. Yeah. I, I remember reading about the budgets here and it's, it's in the millions. Yeah. And apparently if you do a thousand and that, and that, let's say the rent for that tiny home, they probably get a deal anyway, they're government, right? So let's say, let's just say 650 a month, which is pretty cheap and especially in Denver. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, Denver's almost the same as us when it comes yeah. to rent. Um, you know, rent here is you're lucky to find a place for eighteen hundred dollars a month for six hundred square feet. Two thousand for a studio, yeah, with no windows. I know people renting a bedroom for a thousand dollars a month, yeah. And so, so here's a crazy thing. I think I seen this on some kind of social media. I don't know if it's true or not, but this person was written half of his bed for a thousand dollars a month. No, I never heard this. <laughs> yeah, That's I gotta find this thing creepy <laughs> it's very fucking it's very fucking creepy. i'm looking for a cuddle buddy for 800 dollars a month it's very fucking creepy my thing is like suppose you know you you, you know but what if you're a guy you're straight and some you know other guy says i'll do it for you know right you're gonna turn him down like it, yeah that's like where are your sacrifices lying yeah <laughs> like, if you're like what are you gonna do for like a fucking barrier in the bed like what the fuck is this right i i would rather sleep on the floor next to the bed yeah <laughs> No, I don't care who it is. If I, I just mean, don't know them, I, I ain't lying. I, 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 I'd sleep on fucking seawalls. Yeah, outside, or the right? bathtub. Bathtub's yeah. a nice place. I don't know if you've done that in the that summers be, without air conditioning oh, before. Oh, yeah, partially, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been there. A couple ice cubes, cold water. Just kinda... <laughs> but it's ridiculous, right? So what were we talking about again? No, we're just talking about like the homeless budget. Oh, yeah, yeah, homeless budget. But yeah. again, twelve thousand dollars plus whatever they're renting is still cheaper. I mean, people make that in a month. Right. Think about it. Yeah. yeah. That's here in Seattle. Exactly. And again, Denver is kind of the same thing. They got their own tech boom going on. Mm -hmm. And I know my one friend who does live down there, her rent has quadrupled yeah. probably in the last eight years. And I heard it's hard, again, it's hard to find a place. And it's just interesting that, yeah, let's, okay, let's say between the rent and the $1,000 a month, yeah. we'll say it's 30 grand a year per person, again, opposed to yeah. possibly 100. Thousand plus again. I, I saw. I remember. I've seen this huge number. It was per person, because what they're doing is they're taking them to the hospital all the time. So once you can get a person sober, where they can have a job, they can get a job as long as they have a mail mailbox and a house, and everyone deserves it, right? And that's what people realize. All like, deserve a house. People don't realize you can't get a job without an address. Yeah, it's, it's, it's impossible. impossible. Yeah, absolutely impossible. And you don't have the right paperwork. You don't have the right uh, just direction, and Thankfully, those people do want to, want to change. Yeah. Uh, I've definitely been at my low in my life. I actually did live out of my car for a few weeks, uh, way back in the day in Chicago. Um, just, you know, my, my jobs, uh, my, my bar actually had gone out of business. Um, and I was without a job. It was slow season for trade shows. So I was in a really big slump. And I, you know, I, I don't have a big family or anything. I can't, couldn't really ask. So what people. kind of car was it? Because you're, you're, you're a big girl. So, Okay. So my stuff was in my car. I, I only, I remember I only slept two nights in my car. Okay. Uh, Chrysler Sebring convertible. That had to be uncomfortable. In, yes. It had to be uncomfortable. With a yes. And how do you, I, do you, you probably, how do you get even to sleep? You just, you just sleep in the car. Yeah. I don't know. You, you're just so exhausted. And I definitely slept in some people's sofas. I didn't tell my family. I, I don't, of course so, not. So, and just, you know, like I have a tiny, tiny family. I literally just have like my dad. Um, I have an aunt and then I have a handicapped brother. That's it. And then I have a cousin, that cousin in Kosovo, that that's his, that's actually my dad's cousin. So really she's like a second cousin, third removed or whatever. Yeah. So, um, that, that's it. Yeah. So I wasn't going to stress my dad. I knew it was only temporary. Yeah. And I, again, I'm, um, I've been a, I only drink. I don't, I don't really do anything else. So it's not, it wasn't like any, anything happened. So I, and I, I wanted work, but, um, even in, in my situation, like I had to, Kind of just sleep on people's friends' couches yeah. and go around, and it freaking sucks. And I get it. And I've had people come into my bar being like, "Hey, I'm homeless. Do you guys have any food you can throw out?" Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "Unfortunately, our bar is so great in, in a sense. It's really good at no food waste." Yeah. So unfortunately, I'm like, "I'm sorry." Like, you know, but but again, we do live around a bunch of places with amazing missions that yeah. give lunches. I'm like, "Hey, there's three missions over here. Go find you something." Yeah, Seattle definitely has a lot of great organizations doing stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. 
they're, they're always feeding everybody and that's pretty cool so one thing one i did this experiment one time um one day i kind of one, one good thing about uh, maybe it's not a good thing but most homeless people in seattle don't ask for anything right mm -hmm. I, maybe once a few do but one time i counted all the homeless people walked by right it's like 25. i thought myself, Low. yeah yeah i thought myself if i gave each of these dudes a dollar mm -hmm. And then times that by 365. Mm. It's not doable, right? No. You, you can't do no. it. No. What is that? Yeah. You can't do it. And yeah, especially with how much things cost, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It's amazing how inflation and just demand just skyrocketed. I remember I could yeah. get a whole one bedroom place apartment in Chicago in here. It was around 850. Oh, yeah, easily. Yeah. And you you were that was the nice place, yeah. right? Like you were on the thirtieth floor yeah. somewhere for eight fifty. Had a nice view and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, maybe not quite as updated. Yeah, but it had everything you needed: air, air conditioning, heating, you know, all all the the works. You were safe, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. And now you're lucky to get it for two thousand. Oh yeah. 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 Um, so you live in this neighborhood? I do. Um, mm -hmm. how long do you live here? I want to say about seven years. Okay. And then so I've you, worked here for nine years. Is there like an apartment, a condo, or? Apartment. Apartment. Yeah. So I'm still paying rent. Yeah. Okay. And so like, it's like, does it come with a garage? Is that kind of stuff? Yeah, so pay extra. Yeah. Okay. So you just doing the street parking thing? I pay 2200 a month. And I've been very lucky no one's ever raised it. Okay. Is it on the street? Or is it like, we're, we're like, no tell the address, of course, but like, we're. Yeah, there. it's, it's, uh. Uh, I mean, it's, it's overlooking the water. Okay. So I do have a very nice view. Okay. Um, but I actually, funny story is I best move I ever had is I literally moved next door. So I had a street view mm -hmm. and then I literally moved next door when my, my neighbor <laughs> moved out. It was the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. Right. Um, and so, so yeah, now I get to see the water where I would kind of just see the street and you could still, we call it a slice of water. You yeah. Say, it's a slice. Yeah, and now I do get the whole. Okay point so again it's it kind of wrap around where we were talking before when i go home i feel like i'm on vacation a little bit yeah. that it that, that does help i get to look at the the sound and watch nice. the sunsets and it really just makes a whole difference but i guess the reason i got into this building particularly was because um because it felt like that yeah and it's really hard to find places with balconies so i got a place with a balcony oh, there's, there's a few out there yeah. but um it's just so much more worth it to get that fresh sea air. <laughs> yeah, I get that vitamin D, especially yeah. in Seattle. Like yeah. in the winter time, if there's ten minutes of light that comes in, I am out there sitting with yeah. a hot tea. <laughs> I'm in a little robe or something, but I'm still getting some sun. And for the price that I'm getting now, is pretty good compared to other places that don't yeah. have it. And I'm just gonna hope it still stays that way. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So this is I've said this before. This is my solution to the homeless problem, right? And of course, I'll, I'll tell you how, after this, how I'm a hypocrite, right? So my solution is this, like, every homeless person has to have someone that loves them, right? A friend, a father, a cousin, some, right? Or like- Community helps it. You know, like, like you know, like, suppose you got an email, something like, hey, your cousin, John Bob's homeless, he needs help. Obviously, you're gonna go help him out, right? Yeah. Like, but me being a hypocrite, I would tell no one, I want to fucking help you know. You don't want to bother anyone. No. You wanna, yeah, no, I understand. It's, it's yeah. my, it's my mm -hmm. problem, right? Mm -hmm. But like, it has to be some kind of way where like people go through like, get information. Where's your family from? Of course, you can't make them tell, you know, mm -hmm. but like, yeah. Well, actually, so I don't know if you remember the guy. Well, actually, back now. So he used to sleep in front of the post office. Yeah, him, that black guy. Yeah, he's, um, shoot, I forgot his name. Darn it. Okay, so all the, all the wonderful people at Central, mm -hmm. they really know him. And what was cool was uh, his daughter actually found him. Okay. She's from California, found him after years, brought him back. He came back because he doesn't like that lifestyle. Yeah. He has to be on the street now. This is still where I was told. So there's a guy. So I got here in March, right? And so I see him every day, right? So I think June or July, this guy upstairs, I talked to us, hey, what's the deal with this dude in the front of the post office? And mm -hmm. he said, hey, I've been here for six years, but I was told he's lived in the front of the post for prior years. Mm -hmm. People try to help him. Mm -hmm. He won't take help. They think it's dementia, you know. But like, like, what can you do about that, right? Right. Like, I mean, there's no law that says, you know, you're forcibly 
put them somewhere. It's like, yeah. And, and again, it's a choice, which is sometimes it's interesting to think about I, that he's chosen that spot. And he's also like, again, there's so many shelters, but he still chooses to be right out there. And he's a really cool guy. Like I've observed him. I haven't really completely talked to him. Yeah. He's not, nice. I'm not he's... usually in that area a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. But I, like, I know he, like one of the bars have given him a seat. So during busy times, he'll like watch the street and yeah, like watch over things. And almost like the security guard. Kind of, yeah. Or or the maybe he's kind of the gossip girl too. You yeah. know, it's like, hey, I saw this today. Did you did you hear about this? You know. So one time this happened like a while ago, right? It was like early in the morning, like six, seven in the morning. And um, these two homeless people, these two homeless females started fighting, right? He got up, he actually broke it up. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. You broke it Vigilante up. Vigilante then, yeah. He, he like broke it up, right? What the fuck are you doing, right? You can't do this here, right? And the lovely thing about uh, all the locals that have been here for a while, like we do know some of them by name and they really are like the mayors of the area. And when new people come in, they make sure, hey, you behave because this is my home too, Yeah. you know? But you're the thing to do, like, like your daughter Kim got you right, like, like man, like like you would think. I mean, you think, man, you you, you don't. You, I mean, you love the street more than your daughter, right? Mm -hmm. Your daughter, or she be at home and stuff, you know, like. And it, it had to break your daughter's heart. And maybe may, may, maybe correct. It might have been niece. Now I'm thinking about. Okay. But either way, family either way, family member. Uh, either family member had to break the heart, right? Right, and had to break brought, the heart. Brought him back, and it was by his choice too. I mean, he obviously went, but then apparently it just didn't compete. But you also hear about that, like with people who continually go through the prison system. They just Go back know that time. life more than whatever life they're putting into mainstream. Very interesting. Like how disconnected or, or yeah. in their own side that path. And, that and like the guy says, he has dementia, supposedly, you know, stuff mm -hmm. part of, you know, and then like, what do you do? Like, do you put him in a mental home, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Like I say, people smarter than me with way more money. Hasn't <laughs> figured it out yet. Right. And you, and you don't know where, I don't know where that line is where you become a ward of the state either. You know, I and mean, he's obviously able to hold a conversation and everything. So, yeah. but you would think someone's like, okay, this dude's been here for 12 years. That, that's, yeah. We got to do something, right? But think about it. Have you lived somewhere 12 years? That's, that's your home. I haven't yeah. even lived in this apartment of mine for 12 years yet. Like, I can't imagine living somewhere for 12 years and being like, okay, bye. <laughs> that's hard for everybody. Oh, no, man. It's like, that's, but I like heat. <laughs> I need a heater. So, <laughs> but, He's, yeah. he's doing great, I guess. Yeah. I mean, like, he was like, he walked and he goes somewhere at night, right? Like sometimes, at, but, yeah. the, but in the summer, I know he's out there just yeah. you know, being the guard of the post office. And I, I know the post. People. Maybe that's, maybe that's how he gets value. Right. My, my, my value to me is like, I, I make sure that's how the post office, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. And he, again, he's the mayor of the post office. Yeah, pretty much. And yeah, and there's a, there's another girl that comes around. Her name's Sheila. She's mm -hmm. a sweetheart. Um, she has her own thing going on and we we know usually where to find her. And a lot of times um, when we don't see her for a while, again, in, in our, like, especially the bartender communities, we will be like, Hey, has anyone seen Sheila in a while? We're kind of concerned about her. And it's just really neat that you have, again, still have that community within different layers of society. Mm -hmm. And she'll look out. She'll be like, Oh, Hey, how are you? Like, are you okay? Or, or if I drop something, she'll be like, you drop something. Where someone else would be like, oh, it's mine now, right? Yeah. yeah. She'll, she kind of looks out for people. Mm -hmm. So another thing, like all these people like, you know, down the luck, you have to think like, what decisions did they make in the past to put them here, right? I know. Of course, some of like not their fault, you know, but like, you know, somebody like maybe turned down a job or took a job that got fired or they did something like, wrong. Like mm -hmm. what decisions they made in the past? Like, right. Because I mean, I could be wrong, but no one like, you know, becomes homeless, right? Like you don't start off usually, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. decision points that happen. At least in America, you don't usually yeah. start off. Yeah, it. either like either it's your fault or someone's fault where you get fucked around and right. get homeless, right? Sometimes chemical dependencies. Uh, I do know uh, one of my best friends. Who's, uh, oh, she still kind of does, um, but she definitely was more and more full time before she had her kid. Um, worked in a NICU, worn it, yeah. And the NICU, um, with all the ba the premature babies, a lot of them were premature from homeless people who were on drugs. Yeah. And so you get the drug addicted babies too. And I don't know what happens with them. I don't, they know they go back to their moms sometimes. And so yeah. do they have that chemical connection? I think that's still a study that's happening, you know, continually going on all the time. Like, well, 
you know, do they, they split off from, from that lifestyle or do they continue because the chemicals, yeah. you know, and what do we do as a society um, to help? And of you course, know, you know, it, to my mind, everyone has a good heart, but man, it's like, there's not enough resources to help everyone, right? It is hard. Yeah. Right. I mean, something, I mean, you have to help yourself. Of course, I hate, I hate to use the term bootstrap, you know, because everyone does have boots. They want to say, yeah, you know, that's true. That's a good way to put it. You know, everything, yeah. everything, put, put it by bootstrap. Oh, motherfucker, these I don't, motherfuckers, think, I don't have both. These motherfuckers are fucking barefoot, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, so like, how do you like, you can't, it's like, man, it's like, but then again, you think about like, there's been poor people since the beginning of time, right? Right. Exactly. There's and always the downtrodden, the poor, you know, like, and many people go, th no matter where you are in financially, there's always problems. Oh, yeah. And it just depends. It's for sector Resources too, right? and some someone middle class will be rich or someone like nothing. Mm -hmm. Middle class person is fucking poor to someone who's a fucking multimillionaire. Exactly. Well, Martin, relative. Multimillionaire is fucking poor to fucking Elon mm -hmm. Musk, you know? Right. And there's some people who do get rid of everything. They're minimalists, but they're probably the happiest they've ever been, too. So you yeah. just never know. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it's like, what makes you happy, right? What makes you happy without fucking just doing someone else over, you know? Right. And you still be able to take care of yourself, too. And that's yeah. the most important part. And I think a lot of people, especially since the pandemic have recognized I need to take care of myself. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, Cause I can't take care of me. I can't take care of anybody yeah. else. I mean, that's one quote. Of course, COVID was kind of bad. People died, all kind of stuff, but like it has some good things too. Right. A lot of business did thrive during COVID. Mm -hmm. A lot of people had mentality. Okay. This is like, I want to say like, it's about me, but it's like, it's about me. Right. What am I going to make myself happy? Take care of my family versus right. like, do this corporate bullshit and I fucking right. take care of everyone else, you know? Right. I remember I just read an article, I think, yesterday, and it was about uh, how ever since the pandemic, people are really, truly outright saying, I'm taking a mental health day. Yeah. And that even, you know, back in the day, if you had 100% no call off, even in school, you were really proud, right? Yeah. And now we're like, no, don't give it to anybody else. Just yeah. stay home. Like, it's okay to miss the day. You'll be yeah. fine. Like, generally, <laughs> gets a lot of, like, criticism. But, like, man, this mental health day is, like, Mm -hmm. I grew up the day like, motherfucker, you better fuck, suck that shit up. Right. If you're not throwing up, you go to work yeah. or you go to school. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You're like school days, like a broken ankle. Like you better hop your ass over there. Right. Yep. <laughs> you're depressed. Like, probably like back in the day, if you had a job, it was like, hey, I'm, I need to take a day. I'm sick. I'm depressed. Oh, we don't really be depressed. You're fucking fired. Yeah. You weren't recognized for any sanity yeah so I, I give them credit for that right mm -hmm. now of course some of them fucking take the extreme right of course <laughs> you know like dude that's their option i guess <laughs> like dude you depressed every fucking friday then we should probably talk to a therapist every friday you depressed? Help. yeah yeah but uh so you want to do another drink i say uh you break before yeah. i take another yeah. drink yeah 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 because i've already it's passing through me <laughs> okay yeah no problem you too. I'll be back. Okay. So Tosh gonna take a potty break, as they say. Yeah. So for those of you in the Seattle area, I'm pitching Kevin's HR tomorrow at New Tech um, Northwest East Side. You go my LinkedIn profile. Those are like all the invites in there. So basically, it's like a 10 minutes pitch for Kevin's HR, giving everyone an update on um, where we're at with Kevin's HR and trying to find investors. So hopefully, y'all can come out to that. And for the same reason, Cameron is out. So we go check that out.
<laughs> Sounds great. I'm still like, hmm. So I'm going to toss it back from the quickest potty break in the history of the world. Oh, oh yes, I power washed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I came back in and it smells amazing. It smells like a campfire in here now from all it the does, smoking yeah. of the cocktails. It does, it does. I'll say, uh, which one haven't we had yet? We've done Mezcal. I did the Frank August. You did the um, Woodenville. See, there's some bourbons I'm not sure if I want to smoke. Mm hmm. Let's try it. Well, we have it. Let's try it. Yeah. You want to be my guinea pig? Yes. Of All course. right. <laughs> yeah. And drunken fruit is the best. So I'm going to leave that lemon peel in there. Let's soak it up. Okay. Also, side question What is this sword? Are you taking off corks off of large bottles of champagne? No. So, <laughs> What's uh, the story behind this? So when I was in the army, I was a. Uh, 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 basically, so in the army, it's called Brigade S1. Okay. But it's actually like an HR officer. So I was an HR officer for like an organization, like, like 8,000 people. Wow. I did a few years, and when I left, that's like the gift the, the, the Brigade Commander gave me. It's amazing. Yeah. Aww. It's actually like an actual replica. It's actually a Roman sword. So I'll pull that one. Okay. So. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. How much does this sheath weigh alone? It's, 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 not, it's not light. Wow. Yeah, that's a good, like, oh, I feel royal just yeah. holding this. Yeah. So you definitely fuck some people up with this. <laughs> I have um, my father and grandfather's cane collections. And of course, my name is stuff in a grave bonus. Oh, oh yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I have their cane collection, and they, they have some of those old canes where the, the sword is still, like, oh, yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah, and then what, another one has, like, a little vial where you can put like, your medication yeah. in. I might have a cane, but I still fucking cut your ass up. Yeah. I was like, kind of reminds me of it, but it, I mean, obviously, it's way better. Oh, I'm so happy we got this motor working. What a better way to spend a day. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my ice cubes are getting sad. Did so you ever tell, tell us, like, your, your personal bourbon collection, your personal collection? Oh, <laughs> well, the thing is... So like I don't buy a whole lot. Um, a nice thing about being a mobile bartender, which is what my company is, um, it, yeah, like, so I don't all like do just weddings. I still do like private parties and events, and um, everyone is really nice by not only tipping me in cash, but they tip me in bottles. Oh shit! Um, nice. So I have a decanter filled with some Blue Label, uh, okay, uh, and some Johnny Walker Blue Label, which is <laughs> people think like johnny walker okay yeah it's mainstream it's good but when it comes to bartenders especially like more local stuff seems to be a little more favorable but for some reason johnny walker's blue just still just, speaks to me yeah. i don't know what it is so i do have that i have a hibiki um so pretty much anyone who's just kind of tipped me out with a okay. bottle of nice booze yeah. has been appreciated um i did have a hundred dollar bottle of bourbon it was still called bourbon from Iceland. That was probably one of my favorite. I wish I could remember what the name of it was. Um, if you've been to Iceland, it is probably, it is like the main one there. I just can't think of the name right now. But that one, I finally finished the bottle after four years of being, have been there. Um, yeah, bourbon is definitely solid. Nothing, you, like, like you, uh, if you can drink a bottle of party like one day, you know, one night, you, you I mean, you really can't drink a bottle of bourbon one night no and it's kind of blasphemy if you do <laughs> or let I me mean, if you got the money you got the money i guess but um yeah i mean it's, it's not any different than a fine wine right it's it's aged someone's taking care of it like a little baby and it's meant to be sipped and it, it's kind of so like a running joke between a lot of bartenders is some people do get gray goose and red bull yeah it's like why are you getting the top shelf when you're mixing it yeah a soda or, or like you know why why you you know getting this 100 dollars bottle of bourbon and put like a 35 cent coke in it yeah right or there are actually some bourbons or any any liquor if you were to say hey i want this with coke and some people be like absolutely not yeah we won't do it here yeah because we just don't even want that image mm -hmm. of you tainting it this, with this, sugar this water and bubbles a, this is not fucking jack and coke place <laughs> yeah yeah or just get the damn jack like cool jack's great with coke but it's 
whatever you're yeah. yeah that's one thing i wish you know i could go back in the day like i learned about real bourbon too late in my life right i spent my mind i wasted too much time in my life drinking fucking bullshit bourbon with coke right <laughs> I, I learned like the real bourbon like too late in life ah i got you yeah yeah you know what because again you you do all the mainstream you're gonna know the mainstream first like yeah. we call a lot of tissues kleenex right like it's yeah. all kleenex mm -hmm. so once you do find that small brand that's really solid yep. you're like oh. now yeah. i know why this is their baby yeah yeah now i get it mm -hmm. my, my mind's opened up now mm -hmm. like i even i went to the jack daniels distillery uh for the tour cheers um and they have a green label you can only get the green label there and technically you can only buy the green label um by the, the small cask for like three hundred dollars, whatever it was, it was or three thousand dollars. It was something crazy, but you could still get a three ounce mini bottle. I want to say it was there. Whatever the legal amount, they're allowed to only sell because of Dry County. You can't. You have to go farther out to yeah. get the actual samples. But they they're allowed to do a certain amount of airplane bottles, basically a little larger. And the green label was something I've never tasted. And I, to this day, I can still barely remember it. And I'm sad because I want to go get it again. And the only way to do it is to go to the distillery or, yeah. or again, just buy the giant. I don't have $3,000. Have you done, have you done that? I think it's called the, the bourbon tour in Kentucky. Uh, bourbon trail. Bourbon yeah, yeah, I have not. Yeah. Um, that is something I would like to do. Uh, also being a bartender, you, you get to talk to a lot of uh, companies that come in and a lot of ambassadors. And one nice thing is. Uh, Maker's Mark actually will give you a form where you can have a plaque of your name or whatever you want engraved on that. And that barrel is kind of like yours in a oh, sense. Shit. And so I have that. Okay. And I'm kind of waiting for a special moment or a special time to do it. And when I do get to do that, that's when I want to do the bourbon tour and find my barrel with my plaque on it. Okay. I just don't know what I want to put on it yet. Yeah. It'll hit me when it's time. All right. <laughs> so... Back to your business. Yeah. Why did you start your business? And first, what's the name, what's the name of your business? PNW Bar Events. Does that name like, mean anything or is significance? Or it's a random name. I mean, Pacific Northwest is PNW. So I'm within that area. So I want to make sure people knew that. But I still do travel if someone pays for it. I have done it. I've gone to Florida. I've gone to Texas um, for private events. I actually do a lot of yacht work as well. Uh, I do bartend and, and cook on yachts. I'm officially a yachty. Have you ever done the below deck thing? Okay. Like, Kind of real. Um, <laughs> it, they're amazing people, but you are uh, you have to be on point all the time. Um, so why did you start it? So when I moved to Seattle, so so my nightclub closed in Chicago. I so did, what, what year did you move here? 2016, 17-ish. And why Seattle, all the places you go to? So I was also working the trade shows. And when I came here, I just fell in love every time. And I felt you must have came in the summer and not in June. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know, actually I also wanted to sound of the fall. I still had some cold jackets. But again, I love that there's like barely any snow here compared to uh, Chicago. Um, my nightclub had closed completely. So I was, uh, that's when I was out of that job, right? And I was kind of like just couch surfing, basically. Mm -hmm. And I did meet a gentleman who was my vessel here. We did date. We, we were boyfriend girlfriend for a year or two and still my friend to this day um and so between that the weather just being more mild in the winter and then I, it kind of felt like half of a europe where you were again i can just go alone as a woman go around to the bars talk to people yeah, you're right like seattle yeah. is like almost exactly like germany yeah as far as weather and that kind of stuff it's almost i don't know if people don't realize like i mean seattle is actually higher up than boston Right, right. When I found out, it blew my fucking mind. I think we're on the same as maybe London. Yeah. We're, 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 we're way in the fuck. I mean, they, <laughs> they call us South Alaska for a reason. <laughs> right. And the, yeah, you have the thing called the Seattle freeze where yeah, the there freeze. are some That's what we're people saying. who, yeah, it took me a while to like, oh, yeah, because I'm a social person. Yeah, that's what we're saying. And yeah, some people don't want to socialize, which is cool. But then again, if you're at a bar, most of the time, those yeah. people go out to see so, other people. <laughs> one example I heard of that, right? <laughs> is like, this is the newspaper article where they talk about Seattle Free, so I first moved here. Supposedly, like, this couple, this family moved to Seattle, right? Mm -hmm. They joined a church. 
and the church said, hey, we need volunteers to help like, pick the trash up or whatever. Hmm. And so the volunteer picked trash up. No one talked to him, right? Wow. Yeah. No one talked to him, right? So like, man, it's some fucking bullshit here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you finally start realizing it. And it's, it's actually really funny as a bartender because you do people watch, right? Especially when it's slow. And you, you get some of those tables of like four people and they're all on their phone, not yeah. talking to each other. And then you're yeah. wondering, are they talking to each other? Maybe they why, are texting why, each why, other. I don't why, know. Why are they even here? Right, exactly. And I'm sure they have good times, but there's a, apparently like a timeout time on the phone where everyone's just doing it. I'm like, okay. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> Maybe we're all getting older too. So like, you know, I, I remember I got my first cell phone. And I was one of the first people to do it just because I was lucky and I worked in like a in tech when I was in high school. And I had that little Nokia phone you yeah. could throw against the wall, do yeah. nothing with, but yeah. you still like had to talk to people. And you had a cell phone. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing because apparently all, a lot of these kids still talk to people when they're on the video games or whatever. But it's, it's just I'm someone that has to read facial. Yeah. And my thing with the phone, we have so much information, right? Right. I mean, I'm not like, remembering half of it, too. Yeah. Oh, well, that makes sure we have this phone. It's insane. Mm -hmm. Hey, when it's social time again, that's why I love that bar, the Black Horse, because no phones. You need to be a, be social. Go well, back to your business. <laughs> yeah, you started it in like 2019, 2020. Yeah, so I didn't make an official registration or my name. It was just just my own DBA. You were illegal for a little bit. <laughs> I was just a 1099 contractor. I still paid my taxes, um, but I didn't have a name or registered. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and again, that's because when I moved here, I couldn't find a job, mm. and I always like a little home job while I'm doing the trade shows. And my trade show still was my full time, so I'm like, okay. And I it just went out and did my thing. And if um, something would arise, it did. And so then I, I started off on I think on Craigslist looking to see if anyone needed a bartender and then i just kind of it's still like around. to me it's still insane that people find jobs in craigslist i know it's like it is boggling my mind this day i know people do it and find jobs this is boggling my life. i think craigslist i think shady shit you i know, know. Like, <laughs> it is boggling my mind people, it's like it's just boggling my mind people find jobs in something about the job section still works yeah it's, it works yeah it's still the classified it, it, too it, you know it, 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 it fucking works right yeah it's the newspaper that's on the internet yeah. that we would go and, back in the day and look for jobs and there are cakes like 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 it, it's, it looks horrible. The use experience is horrible, but it fucking works mm -hmm. some kind of way. Like no one's, it, it's never been upgraded. No, like new tech, no new design. Nothing changed. Nothing, Nothing changed. It's actually, it's old, reliable, if anything. But it, yeah, it, it fucking works, right? <laughs> it's fucking insane. You think of Craigslist, you think about, you know, like, I don't Stalking. know, sketchy stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know, sketchy stuff, you know, like random, like criminal shit. Mm -hmm. but like, you sell but, something, someone's going to steal it. But it works yeah. some kind of way. Mm hmm. And the, again, my favorite part is the odd jobs gigs area. Mm. And you still can find some like other trade show stuff or other weird random jobs that you're never going to be bored with because yeah. it's just a tiny little thing. Yeah. So that's why I think where I started off and it just snowballed. It really did. Yeah. It's word of mouth. So you yeah. came to Seattle. You decided to start the bar. Mm -hmm. Like talk about some of the challenges of starting it. Uh, got all the, I mean, just red tape. And bad. unfortunately. I can't imagine the red tape is on a bar. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and I don't have a brick and mortar. When I when I say I'm working at the bar, it's like the other bar that I'm yeah. just kind of helping out at. It's, yeah. You know, different locations. That right. And stuff, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm bringing the bar table. You're, you're kind of like a remote bartender. So I am. Yeah. I literally mobile bartending. Right. And so. so cheers, my friend. Cheers. Is. Woo. Best day ever. Drinking. Oh. On the podcast. Thanks. <laughs> I'm having a great time. Um, I, Yeah. Paperwork's the hardest. Uh, again, coming from Chicago, the laws here are a little harder and stricter. I'm going to give me a bottle of water while you're talking. Okay? Yeah, please. Um, it, it needs a little updating. We'll say that. I, I, I understand some of them. Some of them are just like, eh, again, I know there's some states where, hey, if you appear to be 40 or up higher, you don't have to ask for an ID. And... It's still kind of an unclear line here, technically, but when you get your license, you're, you, know, you still have to ask everybody. Um, but kind of, kind of going again with the international people, they're freaking 80 years old. Like, I feel bad asking. I feel awful. Like, even though some people are like, oh, yeah, I've never been asked. Like, Thank you. And like, I've been drinking since I was 14 yeah, years old. Exactly. And especially as a European, too. Like, 
there's no either there's no drinking age or it's yeah. 19 18, yeah like 16. i know Germany. the rule is like if you can see over the bar you can order a drink don't, <laughs> yeah, care, don't nice. care how old you are right and then like you know how many people have had their parents when you were a kid like hey you want to try this yeah i remember that's actually why i didn't drink for a while i didn't start drinking until i was 23 mm -hmm. which is funny to think that i went in the bartending when i yeah. hated alcohol yeah. hated it and my parents gave me rolling rock oh my god Blech. they did it on they did it i think they did they did it on, did. Did it on purpose <laughs> but that's what they drank they did it on purpose and then my entire family drinks uh beef feeders on the rocks with vegetables my entire family besides myself and one other family member and that's it and so to this day just smelling it i, I can't do it yeah. even though i love gin i actually really do love gin but i can't particularly do beef feeder just because it would be on their breath as a kid right and so i was just associated with it yeah. they would have me try it and i was like <laughs> no it burns it burns <laughs> and uh so you know my parents were, were cool and let me try it um but we have a joke uh we have something called nat water so short for natasha natalie and natalia is nat or for nathan as well right so i go by nat sometimes <laughs> i was 15 my parents took a trip uh, to California, we, we would go to the Pismo Beach, as I was saying before, and we would take the Amtrak and they didn't want to pay for booze. So they put, uh, actually, thankfully, it was vodka in a bottle. I don't know how they never drank vodka, which was really odd. So they had vodka in a water bottle. I did not know about this. We get there. I go swimming and having a great time. I come back to the hotel room. I am thirsty. So I take this bottle of water. Glug, 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 glug. Oh my God, my throat is on fire. I start pouring it down the drain. I start yelling at my parents, this water's bad. And they're like, stop, stop pouring it down the drain. I'm like, no, it's good. And they're like, no, that's vodka. And it costs money. Stop pouring it down the drain. I, 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 I have a story just like that, right? Oh, yes. So I'll say, we say so far to right. And we have friends come all the time, right? And we're like, I had like three or four of my friends there, right? And we're drinking uh, like a vodka orange juice, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the tall glasses, you know, kind of strong, right? And so my daughter, Ashley, thinks it was eight or nine at the time, right? So back in the day, kids played outside, right? So we went outside, she ran, a, she ran outside, and I had no time to react. She's like, I'm so thirsty. Can I have your drink, Dad? And drunk half of it. And it's like, she's like, <laughs> if she could have passed, she would have said, what the fuck is this, Dad? <laughs> Was orange juice went sour? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I see the drunk and like gunk, 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 gunk. Oh, of course it was cold, so it probably tasted right. Good. And like, at least it was juice. And then it's like, flick. Like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. But yeah, but yeah. And mine was pure booze. I feel for her. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. amazing. But yeah, and so now we call vodka nat water now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> to this day. Nice. nice. Yeah. So for your business, like, mm -hmm. you started your business pre-COVID. What? So we talk about the challenges. Mm -hmm. How do you like, how do you like do the, um, like, how do you convince people to use you, so to speak? Uh, you know, experience is huge. You can get a bartender technically anywhere in a sense, like everyone wants to be one. And it's kind of like between cook and chef. You're, there's, there's really no particular. Cook at Denny's. System. A chef at a yeah. pasta restaurant. But there's like no degree or no, it, technically you don't have to go to school to be a chef like as long as you're the top cook you are the chef right and if you're the only cook technically you are the chef but everyone can say a different i might have people yelling right now like ah, stop like what are you talking about um and when i when i cook on the yachts people call me chef and i'm like I'm, I'm like i'm good but i like i didn't go to school i don't i i, I don't know how to make sushi I, I i mean i know how to make sushi i'm not good at making the sushi so like there there's certain things that I, I almost feel dirty saying yeah. chef in a sense. Um, and that's kind of like between bartender and you hear this thing, this word mixologist float around, which yeah. is kind of sometimes poo pooed on. Um, so what, so, so to go back around, not only are you going to get someone that's going to make a good drink, cause I do have employees too. So it's not just always me and I do help them with the cocktail creation, but whoever is there needs to have that social experience. Um, if you don't smile, forget it. Yeah. Smiling is like number one. Yeah. I can never record you. I, I never smile. Yeah. You would fire me all day. <laughs> oh, Jason. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying my best. Smiling I'm here. Try, I'm trying my best. <laughs> but okay. One nice thing about, especially 
most of the drinks or excuse me, mostly the events I do is it's open bar. So who's cranky with an open bar with free drinks? If you're cranky, you have a whole nother thing going on. You probably just need to leave the party you at some, this point. You got some challenges. Exactly. Exactly. And I've I've seen a couple of them. You're like, mm, how did you even get invited? <laughs> but yeah, the experience is number one. Speed is number two. Um, with, with quality. So speed and quality are kind of like connected, right? So you need to make sure everyone's not waiting a million years for a drink. Um, and that is how you also get cranky people is when they are waiting and I don't mind. I don't, I don't like waiting in Disneyland lines for two hours either. Um, so, you, so you're trying to get that, that good combination where you can get speed and quality and then presentation. So some people might not be able to present, present their, their, uh, yeah, right. some kind of flair, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A garnish is really an amazing, uh, wrapping paper in a sense. And again, you eat with your eyes. Uh, so the first thing you're doing, you're going to look, yeah. right? And you're like, oh, Pre that looks delicious. Presentation matters, right? Exactly. And then you taste it. And then there's, how does it feel later? And and you try to find a signature drink that also matches with whatever's going on in the environment. So what's really cool is like a lot of weddings I work at, they have their animals kind of involved. And so what, what they do is they actually, usually there's like two animals, no joke. It's, it's crazy how it works out this way. Probably 25% of my weddings name their drinks after their for for babies <laughs> and so let's say they have three dogs they have three cocktails and it's named after their dogs and we just find what the bride and groom like and we put this all together and i actually have an edible topper with their pictures on oh, so wow. whatever the dog let's say theater the oh, dog shit. is now on here and you can eat this edible wafer paper like a church wafer is how i explain it there's no taste but you can eat it and it has the date and and it's just those personal touches that you're not going to find anywhere else. So how do you handle this, right? Suppose you're doing an event somewhere where the event is, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, like you have like, like five, six people in line, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the first person in front of you, they're like fucking needy as fuck, right? That's all these questions. Uh -huh. What are you doing this? Kind of do this, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you handle that? Um, kind of as swiftly as possible, but kind of where we're going with, we don't ask. If someone says vodka soda, and I, I'm not going to ask, do you want the well? Do you want this, right? So we're kind of going towards finding the quickest path to what someone wants. Um, so if they are asking a bunch of questions, if there's a certain point, I'll be like, well, here, why don't you try this one? If you don't like it, come back. And again, it's an open bar too. So if you really don't like it, don't feel bad. You're not, you're, you're not paying for it. It's paid. A little bit goes, it goes, right? People leave their drinks on the tables all the time and the ice melts, you know? So that's probably the best way to do it because usually if they're asking questions, they just don't know what they want. And again, it comes down to my favorite saying is wrangling cats <laughs> being a bartender with drunk adults is literally like wrangling cats and you're trying to get them to do things and it's a little bit like daycare and you're the only sober one in the room pretty much right and it's very interesting to see some people evolve to a a more uh, inebriated state um but again it's also our job to keep people from getting drunk so that's another hard part too you get some of those hard drinkers you it's a free bar right Let's go, let's go, let's go. And then you're like, hey, hey, Uncle Mark. Um, like, Give me the fucking bottle yeah, of tequila. Yeah, here's a glass of water. Come back and see me later. But we don't want any cra anything crazy happening at a wedding. So you're also controlling the si any situations because the last thing you want is some one drunk person to ruin a, a re wedding reception, yeah. right? So um, you, you have to wear five hats. How yeah. you deal with, the, with someone that's like, is a bar where they just says, hey, have a try with me. That's hard. I know. I'll pay for uh, five if I were me. Really, the best thing is put it in the tip. I usually tell them, like, you know what? Just put it in the tip. Like, um, no, I want you to have a shot with me. I know. I like you. I, I like your personality. I'll, I'll do water shots. I do. I still will do something. Oh, shit. That's, I, that's a no good story. Yeah. Right? I actually said this uh, last podcast, right? So you're, you're like this, right? Okay. And admittedly, this is kind of fucked up what I did. So when I was stationed in Italy, I was, I was coming commander, right? Had like people working for me. And is Batista Italy is this place called the Crazy Bull. Every <laughs> Thursday night, they had salsa night. And so everyone went there, right? Every, I mean, all the American Italians, it's like, it's like a lot of people right there. So I went there with a friend one time, right? I go there, I go to the bar, get a drink. Like maybe 10 of my soldiers were there, right? <laughs> you just tell I've been drinking, right? Sir, have some shots with us, right? And the one guy said, hey, sir, I bet we can drink some of your shots. You'll cancel PT tomorrow, right? Oh, no. And so I, I, I'll take you on, right? No problem, right? And so, 
that I've been drinking, before we left, we drank like at least 10, 15 shots of tequila, right? But what they did not know is that me and my wife, my, my three kids, would go there for lunch every Sunday. We knew the owner and the bartender. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So, okay. so on the sly, I told the bartender, after shot two, from now on, give me water. Yeah. <laughs> and so the next day, they're like, and they told, I had like 50 people work for me. They told everybody, me, let's know we're doing fucking PT. We just did 50 shots of tequila with the captain. There's no fucking way, right? Yeah. The next day, I ran them fuckers at a death. And they're like, you can drink like a boss. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they're fucking pawing up and shit. Like, what the fuck's going on? And then like, I told the story that like, some people like five, 10 years later, like, yeah. you motherfucker. Yeah. yeah. Fuck, fuck you. Yeah. And and uh, so a lot of, I get a lot of pregnant women. They're like, hey, because usually most people, most pregnant women don't announce it until about three months in. Mm -hmm. So she's like, hey, they're doing shots. I'm pregnant. Mm -hmm. Whatever they order for me, can you please make me? Yeah. You know, not yeah, think yeah. alcohol because they haven't yeah. announced it yet. And I'm like, yeah. I got you, girl. Yeah, don't yeah. worry. Yeah. 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 yeah so exactly, I, I do yeah. a lot of those. And I don't know if you've heard of the angel shot before. I think I have. So so if a woman feels like they're being stalked yeah, or they feel yeah. unsafe, the angel shot is supposed to be, hey, get me the heck out of the situation. Yeah. Um, I thankfully I've never gotten one of those. Yeah. But I feel I've gotten it where the girls are like, hey, I just don't want to get too drunk because I don't know where I'm at with this date. Yeah. I, you know, I still don't know this person. I'm comfortable. Yeah. I'm having a good time, yeah. but I just don't know where I'm at yet. Yeah. Hey, after four drinks. Yes. Kind of like that. Like, can you just give me something else? Just yeah. so I still can have a fun time. Yeah. And then when I let you know, yeah. like maybe I'll have another one, a real one in like an hour. Yeah. But, uh, you know, w like the, those women have just been very conscious about yeah, how the shame. night's going. It's a shame I know, you know, I know. And unfortunately, I don't know many people who haven't had a nightmare. Um, yeah. I could talk about that as a whole nother story. But, um, you yeah, know, weirdos exist and they really do. And even guys, even I have guys that have weird, awful stories as well. It's just... Uh, I, so for your change. business, <laughs> what what clicked with you? You said, like, you know what? I have something to hear. I might be successful doing this. I uh, was well, that moment. We said, you know what? This is gonna pay off for me. I I, I can, yeah, I can make a living doing this. Mm, I, I hate to say it. The one thing that did kind of help was because there was just such a high demand to the point where people had to keep moving their weddings. So just the demand itself, I was like, oh my gosh. I can do all these. I do have a little bit of that FOMO fear of missing out sometimes on money. And I want to take every job I can. It's just because I do love my job. It's not work, if you know what I mean. And I know that the business is still is pretty male dominated. And a lot of it also is so high end that some of these other people can't afford it, don't want that kind of event. And we kind of give this more middle tone where you still feel like family. You don't feel like you're out of place financially in any sense. So sometimes you do get these really fancy weddings, right? You got, I've, I haven't been to one, but I've heard of like ones where the horse freaking comes in or um, there are, there actually are some amazing Indian weddings I've worked where they've actually an elephant and they, they paint them. They're beautiful. They're amazing. Um, and they, they get the circus, um, like performers and stuff. And they get these big extravagant weddings. And uh, if if you're from the Indian culture, like that's actually pretty normal um, to just have these extravagant, amazing, beautiful weddings. But if you're an outsider, you don't always feel comfortable because you're like, oh, my gosh, like, am I because all that money is floating up there? They sometimes people can feel a little uncomfortable um, thinking that they're they're not in that strata of money. Um. And so, like, our goal is to make everyone inclusive, no matter who you are, to uh, come in and participate and feel like family. And, and by the end of the night, everybody's family. Everybody knows each other. They're they're all blood. It's such a great time. Um, but it's that first, like, hour where everyone's kind of, they don't have it out of their drink yet. They haven't let it loose. And they're just, you know, they absorb everything. And so I try to make that accessible to everybody without feeling like there's some glass ceiling in that sense. What's been like the most weirdest, outlandish, or the most crazy event you've, you've uh, bartended at? Mm. Good or bad. <laughs> I, I knew I really, I won't talk about the nightmare one. I don't. Uh, I don't well, say, we'll just, say. Just remember, no one's going to see this, right? So <laughs> I know. Okay. We'll give a bad one. We'll start with the bad and end with the good. 
bad one. Uh, I personally did not work, but um, one of my coworkers did. And it was at a venue that we normally were at. I know the the venue owner and she's a fantastic person. It's, it's a tiny place. And unfortunately, apparently half the bridal party was part of the Proud Boys and we didn't know it. And they all came in with their colors and the mom was late to the wedding. The mom was late to the wedding. And uh, a few people walked in. They're like, oh, I did not expect this to happen. I'm going to just leave. People actually came because the bar was the first thing they saw when they walked in. And so people just left. And then what happened? Children, we're going to say around 10 years of age, started having fist fights. This is a learned, like a learned behavior. They all like, oh, who are you? I don't know you. And they apparently they had fist fights. Blood, blood was like, like skin was breaking. And they had to kick out the entire wedding early because she's like, absolutely not. She had no idea. And some people call that a good time. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know about 10 year olds though. Maybe, maybe adults. Adults can do their thing. But yeah, these kids apparently were the last straw. And uh, yeah, they, we, the whole party had to be canceled. Because it was just a freaking disaster. <laughs> uh, good side. And I say that, that, yeah, the most craziest one, I would say, um, I was at an Indian wedding. Um, <laughs> and yeah, they had, oh, it was beautiful. They had a painted elephant. You could literally get on the elephant. So in India, it, this happens often. I mean, you can rent. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if rent is the right word, but you there's these... Um, castles but uh this is public areas that are part of royalty that you can have your weddings at and again just having the animals in i think is number one and then their their wedding so they have a they have drinks the pre pre-day and the day of and there's like three days of drinking so you really get to know everyone and so the first day you start to get everybody You're like okay i know your name but then you start remembering their drinks on the second day and then the actual wedding day and it's three days of just partying and just feeling like again everybody's finally a part of that family by by that that last day of the wedding so uh if you're my in-ear friends i expect a wedding invitation I want, <laughs> yes. I, I want to experience this yeah yeah that's amazing there's they're like the, the most beautiful weddings and just everyone's involved and everyone's dances and dresses up i i just can't explain if you've never been to an indian wedding it's something to experience if you, if you can. Yeah. Is there something about the culture that's, I can't even, beautiful isn't even the word. It's, it's so enriching in a sense. And they've just, they just got to figure it out. But for celebrating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So what's, so you started like say 2018, 2019. Yeah. So what's something like when you first started, you're like, man, this, whatever it is, kicking my ass, right? I can't figure this shit out. <laughs> But now you're thinking back, like, how in the fuck was the challenge to be? This is so simple. Uh, well, again, the hardest part here was I got the denial because I was a woman trying to be a bartender here. And which was funny because as in a Chicago it was kind of opposite. If you were a girl, like you automatically got work. And if you're a guy, you got screwed. And here it was kind of the opposite. If you were a that's, guy. That's kind of odd with Seattle being so liberal and stuff, you know. Right. Uh, I think it, it comes down to they just kind of ended up dominating the cocktail industry um maybe they're just i don't know what women were doing here yeah. 50 years ago in seattle maybe just we, different job we placements. know what they're doing back we know what they're doing what aurora avenue did yeah yeah <laughs> um the industry that beats bill seattle right and so and a lot of famous cocktails have come from seattle or re or at least re-established um the negroni you know really Italy, but I know Seattle was like the one of the other between the, Seattle and New York. The two, those two cities, just really inspire half the world with either bringing back old cocktails or coming up with new cocktails. Um, the Sharpie Mustache. You need to look it up. I honestly don't even remember what's in it, but it's like a triple old fashioned with a bunch of other booze, and it was made by a Seattle bartender. And his joke was, someone wanted something really strong. To where you pass out, where people draw a Sharpie mustache on you. And that's how the drink came about. And it's actually a really delicious drink. But you only should have one or two. Um, and and I guess the whole mixologist thing, again, between New York and Seattle. I mean, Chicago was a good part of it, too. But there, I feel 
they were kind of in their own little bubble, especially with speakeasies. But between New York and Seattle, I feel they compete. They try to up, one up each other. And I guess it's, it's more was or at least was more of a do- male dominated area in, in that. And I just either the girls were more silent or maybe they weren't in that kind of cocktail area. Maybe they're more at the dive bars. Again, I, I'd never lived here all my life, so I'm not sure. That'd be great to talk to someone who so does. Everyone wants to be an entrepreneur because it's sexy. You walk your own boss. But talk about <laughs> the unsexy part of being an entrepreneur. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, I guess one of the hardest parts is people try to get free, mm, free advice from you. I'll have people who are like, Hey, before I even give you my deposit, I want the menu. I want the shopping list. I want all this. And I'm like, no, this, this costs money and time. I mean, my time is money. Right. And not only am I creating a, a great cocktail for you, but now I have to do the math. You say you have 100 guests, you have 75 guests, and sometimes you don't even know what the actual guest count is, you know, finalized until a few weeks prior. So you have to find this sweet spot of not running out, but not having too much. And uh, I give I give my clients the option of shopping or they can uh, uh, purchase it through me. Uh, also, because of Seattle laws, I can't actually be like a real bar. I can't charge per drink or anything, I, I have to do it by cost um, when you have these permits. Um, so the hardest, so they're trying to get their shopping list and their menu for free without hiring me. And that, that one's the one probably the hardest because I understand you kind of want to be impressed by the menu, but if you go on my Instagram, you go on my, my website, you can kind of get an idea of, of where we're at. So that's probably the hardest one. I like starting to say no, I don't want to say no, but I'm, I have to like work around a nice way and be like, hey, sorry, like this is something we're going to do later when you have my my company. Otherwise, you're just going to take my recipes, which are mine, and my math and my time, which take a good hour or two. And you're, you might end up getting some other person um, who might be not as experienced and then they're just not going to have a good time anyway. So how do you use social media to enhance your company? Uh, I'm, I'm mainly on Instagram. Instagram. Yeah, Instagram is a big one because photos, and, you know, garnishes especially do help. And then you kind of say what's in there. It really is the best way because they're so pretty. <laughs> yeah. Again, when you go to weddings, especially, or my new year's, anything, because it's a special event, it's going to be unique. So what do you do for new year's? Uh, I do actually work for uh, my one client every year. He has a, a fantastic new year's party. Oh my goodness. Um, at, actually that's where we serve the Sharpie mustache, um, and so a few other cocktails and they just have a, a blast at their house. It's probably almost a hundred people. It's a giant home. So how does someone get invited? Maybe I'll hire you as my bar back. Yeah. I need yeah. To hire yeah. <laughs> you know, all you gotta do is clean up some dishes. Uh, go with that. he has the Moet just handing around. I, oh my gosh, he could probably gets. I'm not even kidding, like 50 bottles of champagne. And we don't even touch that. He he likes to pop those. Yeah. Uh, and we're just making cocktails. How long have you been doing that for him? Uh, three years. Three years. And <laughs> um, a very special backyard tent, which comes with Snoop Dogg cutout, smoking jackets, and special other things that uh, Seattle allows. <laughs> 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 so most of those people sleep over for the night. Yeah, yes. you, you gotta love Seattle. <laughs> yeah, but it's really it's really cute. He has his own. Oh, and sorry, uh, Tolly from South Park is also another cardboard cutout there. Yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. Another so, plus. What's your advice to someone who either wants to be an entrepreneur mm-hmm. or start their own bartending business? Oh, perseverance. Oh my gosh. Um, I was very lucky as a kid. My, my late mother, um, really encouraged me to do my own stuff. Um, the creativity really helps because you, you're always constantly thinking of new things or, or ways to impress people. Um, but she, she actually gave me $250 to start my own business when I was 14. Uh, that was when eBay was around. And I sold cell phone covers for those Nokia phones with the snap-ons where you could like customize your colors. I bought a whole load uh, like from China or something off, um, I don't even know what website, but it was a, you know, a, a mass product, right? 
sold them on eBay, made a profit. After the 250 was done, I got to keep whatever I wanted. So she was the first one to start that uh, for me. And I have had so many little businesses along the way that never stuck. I made custom clocks uh, in college. Isn't it crazy? Like most entrepreneurs start like at an early age, right? Yeah. Like, and like I, I know no one would like, I'm 41 years old, be an entrepreneur, right? It's like somewhere back in the day, either it was cutting grass or selling stuff. Yeah. Lemonade stands. I love lemonade stands as a kid. And actually I was pissed as a kid when I found out you couldn't actually work as a kid. I wanted to work really bad. And then my, I remember my mom was like, no, you have to be 16 to work or 15 with a permit. And I'm like, I'm 12 years old. I'm like, well, I want to work. And I'm like, well, you can cut grass. Yeah, you can you can do some of this. And so she would have garage sales and I was in charge of the garage sales. Um, yeah, I had a little clock, custom clock making business. So if you're a company and you wanted like 150 clocks to have your business logo on to give away, like I literally made everyone. Um, I I built computers when Dell was barely a thing. Dell actually put me out of business in that. That was during high school. I was building computers to, together. Um, I, I had a boutique in Chicago as well. So yeah, I could just kind of have these little side things going, but they never really stuck. I either lost a interest in it or unfortunately, sometimes the taxes just put you down financially. You're just not encouraged by it. So finally, this was the winner. This is the one I was training for all my life. And... Um, I didn't have a whole lot to go by. I know a lot of other people start businesses have t talked to other business owners and got a, you know, kind of got their education off of it. And finally, one nice thing is I, I have connected with a bunch of women business owners that own bars. And that has, I think really fully solidified where, okay, this is where I'm running. This is now I know where I want to be. Um, I'm sticking with this one. It's my baby. And again, I, my, my other goal is to actually have a bar, a brick and mortar bar as well. And they're the ones that have inspired me and kind of taught me, especially pol like politics or red tape or forms, any, anything else that I just was never really educated on. I just want to make sure everything's, you know, cut and dry. So knowing, so if asking questions, I think is the best. I never ask questions where I'm like, oh, I can do this. And now I ask for advice. Um, it's humbling and it's still new in a sense, because no matter what, you're still learning. So I think, I, yeah, I guess if you, if you want to start a business or a bar, you need to just ask questions and find that community where I didn't think I had time before to do it. But if you get even little specks of it, I think it helps about who, you know, to like help you pave that path. Yeah. That's one thing I suck at. I suck at follow up and asking for help. I'm horrible at follow-ups. Yeah. I, I <laughs> so I know you want to open this brick and mortar thing, right? Mm -hmm. But what, how could you make more money doing what you're doing now with the brick and mortar? Because the brick and mortar, it's like, you got to pay for the, the, the lease, all the expenses, electricity, where now you're like, it's like remote, right? So why do remote? I mean, why do the brick and mortar when it's like be more expensive? So I want both. So what's actually really nice is when you have that brick and mortar, um, there's other licenses you can have where I can cater out off of that piggyback catering off of my own business. Um, so not only can I do that side, but now I can double, I can double my capacity, right? So not only do I have a place that people come to me, but now I, but I also have like existing business where I come to them. And so if I can be open every day, those people are always coming in. Events don't happen on Mondays or Tuesdays, right? Um, especially those, like the locations I'm looking at, there's going to be sports events. There's going to be concerts. You say you're looking to do a bar here in Pine. Yeah. I mean, I, so I did put a bit in Capitol Hill, which is also a very busy spot. Oh yeah, definitely. Right. Um, and I was kind of looking at Tacoma even just a little bit, but, um, I think where I want to be is definitely downtown, especially with all the cruise ships. Right. So you have all these people coming from around the world. That's a good point. Right. And then oh, that's the other cool thing. If I, if I'm behind the bar, my own, Brick and mortar, I get to meet all these people. I do love stories. I think that's might be something I'm attracted to with this particular career. Like you get all these people, all these stories. And then it's really nice when people come back. When when you have a regular that you can converse with and care about and you have 
maybe not necessarily a friendship, but you have this this trust yeah. connection between them and you care about them. So uh, one example, even just at the bar I'm working at now, there's another bar that one of my regulars goes to. Neither of us had seen him in a while. So that bar actually called my bar. I answered the phone like, hey, have you seen this? You know, have you seen, you know, this guy? And I'm like, you're right. I haven't seen him in a while. Like, yeah, you're right. I'll, I'll let you know if I see him. They must have manifested it. He shows up the next day. I'm like, hey, so this bar was looking for you. Everything okay? He's like, oh, yeah, I've just kind of been doing my thing. Cool. Well, just so you know, they're like worried about you. So there's a community. And again, that whole Mayberry effect is then. <laughs> Like everyone knows each other when, when you're regulars in, the, in a small section of town. And I think socially, um, maybe it's because I come from a small family that is like an ex extension of my family. And I care about those people and they care about me. It's good re reciprocation. Do you have any, like, I guess the best word, like any bartending mentors? Uh, I wouldn't say anyone specifically, but because there are those, these little groups within either like Facebook or once you get these Facebook groups, you all meet in person. Like everyone in the bartending industry, we have little parties. There's actually a thing called cocktail week or uh, carnival of cocktails and tales of cocktails. Um, that's not in Seattle. That's in um, New Orleans, but there's, there are these little, <laughs> not, I can't really call it a cocktail convention, but these gatherings where you see all of everyone. And so you can, exchange notes, exchange drinks, um, even brand ambassadors of companies come in. So they educate you on their products. And so within all of this melting pot, um, you're, you're never bored. You learn new things. And so if you do need a support of someone, you can call another bar and be like, Hey, I need a bartender. You got, yeah. do you have anyone that you can send over or Hey, I'm having a really challenge, challenging time making this cocktail. What have you guys done? Uh, so community within the bartending industry is huge and also bad as well. So like if, yeah. if there's any rumor, they go around too. But uh, if, if you need to ask something, everyone's willing to give, give out. Can someone be like your bartending apprentice, so to speak? Yeah, um, we call it a stage. Stage. So if you have a stage, it's, it's like a... Um, Oh, what do you call it when you get out of college and you kind of work for free for a moment? Intern? Yes. It's literally a bartending intern. Okay. Yeah. And you, you, most places if you're at a good place, you still get to keep your tips, but you don't get an hourly until maybe after a week or a certain amount of time. So you, so if you want to stage somewhere, that's like your trial time to take that risk because there is a large turnover. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people do drink on the job. So those people are kind of weeded out pretty fast. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. And then there's also the new people or so sometimes their personalities just don't match. And so new hires can be very risky. Yeah. And it's a lot of paperwork. So instead of doing the paperwork, everyone just does a stage and then they, they figure it out from there, whether yeah. you get hired or not. Yeah. Yeah. So back to your business. So you're, you're just like, how far you travel to do your bartending stuff? I mean, if they pay for the travel, I will go anywhere. Okay. Um, again, what, what's the farthest you travel? Florida. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> Someone pay for your travel? Yes. Like they pay for the plane trip. Uh huh. All the now, did you like take the booth with you or you got the booth there? They they do have the booth, so that usually that's a situation where they have to shop for the booth. But I I give them the shopping list and everything. Okay. But, um. Yeah. I just that's, show up. That's fucking insane. Yeah. Uh, I got to bartend for a concert on the beach in Fort Lauderdale with, and uh, they just need a couple bartenders for this concert. And you, you have to think like, you must have a high river chase, like someone from Seattle versus all the bartenders in Florida. Like, I don't know how some of these people find me sometimes and I'll ask, but I never get answers. I mean, ha, ha, I mean you have to like, it has, it has to boost your ego. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> to boost your ego a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I do really like talking to people and I'm always smiling. I, That's a key. I, when I'm working, I don't how or yeah. Yeah. A lot of people are like, I like your smile. That's usually a compliment I get. Yeah. And I don't want that to like inflate my brain or anything, but I, I am genuinely enjoying my job. And as long as, again, usually there are open bars too. So people I'm talking to are happy as well. <laughs> um, I can't have some miserable days at the regular bars. Yeah. Um, but 
everyone's happy. So I'm happy. I there's just and then I'm having fun. And again, I'm not bored. Yeah. Definitely not bored. <laughs> how do you deal with this? Like, for lack of a better term, how do you deal with a creeper mm. like, trying to get on your site? Hey, you're so sexy. I love your smile. Here's my number. You have a boyfriend. Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. And if you how say you yes, they're like, well, he's not here. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Oh my God. You see the headache I have right now? Yeah. Um, it is really hard. I, and I, I find myself being too nice sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, thankfully when it is busy, it's a lot easier and you're just like, Hey, I'm busy. Sorry. I'm taken. Um, I, I gotta work. And it's a little easier to just kind of brush them off. Um, but because they're also a client technically, right? Like yeah. they're a guest of, let's say whatever wedding or event I'm at. Um, you still have to be respectful and, and do it nicely give it to the point. I mean, I guess there's a certain point and like, Hey, I gotta go. Yeah. Right. Um, thankfully I haven't had any weird stalking incidences no. or anything. Yeah. You're lucky. Yeah. I know. I do hear some awful th stories and the bar. Thankfully I haven't. And in Chicago, Oh my gosh, I, I was again, working nightclubs. I'd be the clubs close at four or five in the morning, depending on what day it is. So you get, you leave at six 30 in the morning at the earliest yeah. in a, your a Seattle change. Yeah. Of shit. <laughs> yeah. Change your shit. Love flowing to the morning. Some fucking bullshit. It was so hard to get used to when I got here because people start drinking earlier. Yeah. Most people go home in Chicago and go out at 10. Yeah. They start at 10 p.m. and they go to four yeah. or five if it's exactly. Friday or Saturday. And so that was something to get used to. Um, but I I still felt safe. I, yeah. I was pretty good there. But yeah, I'm still in my little club dress and yeah. my my little heels yeah. and stuff. But looking sexy and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I like it. I was also in my prime in my yeah. like thirties, right? Like, uh, so you just gotta let them off nicely because if you piss them off, they will make yeah. it worse. Yeah, uh, yeah. So this is on TikTok one time. It, to me, this is so funny, right? And of course, it's stage right. I think I'm sure it's stage right. I hope. And, yeah. Yeah. So it was like a Hooters bar, right? And this guy asked this girl, "Hey, you want to go on a date?" And the girl said, "Well, I can't have a boyfriend." And the guy said, "Well, I have a math test." What? What do you mean? I thought we were talking about stuff we can both cheat on. Again, I've gotten the, well, he's not here. I mean, well, I guess that's not any different. And it, yeah, it's a challenge. And if they hear no, they try to find another way to get a yes and try to find another route to get a rest. And they just keep doing it. And it's just like, yeah, just get the point. I mean, a way, like, you got to expect a hustle, right? I mean. Yeah. But then again. Also, no means no. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's kind of like the third rule. If, if I've said no three times. Yeah, three times. Just go. Three times, yeah, three times. I think that's a good rule. Three, yeah. You're no three times. Dude. Yeah. Okay, you really should respect the first one. But okay, if, if you... Also, like, those people usually don't get to know you. They don't... They just go straight up to you and like, Hi, okay. I so, want to go out with you. You're, you're so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, well, yeah, my beauty is one thing. Maybe you haven't even gotten to know my brain. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> the AI is taking over. <laughs> Um, so you are talking about your business some, but go over again, how you started your business or why you started your business. Yeah. Again, it, it's, it basically was, I couldn't find work as a woman in Seattle as a bartender. It was just really hard. And, uh, I went around and just kept getting these no's and I'm like, screw it. I'm doing it myself. I'm, you know, I don't want to say it's to prove it to any, anybody, but I was just sick of hearing no. And I know I could do it but I wasn't sure how to start it. And thankfully I did find like the Craigslist weddings. And then I kind of figured it out, molded it from there. Um, and one nice part is because I'm someone that I can't have a mundane everyday job. Like I worked in an office for two and a half days of my life, two, two and a half days. I have been standing on my feet, getting my steps in since day one. Uh, except for those two and a half days, I wore suits. <laughs> um, I just, I couldn't do it. I, I need to be social and I need to be up and moving all the time. It's just, it's just me. It's my personality. And, and that it, I think that is a lot of the bartender personalities, which is why, again, we're a community. We're very similar in that sense. A lot of us are either like hyperactive or ADHD or just have had that life changing experience where you're, where you, you just can't enclose yourself in one place at one time. 
And so once I started my business, I was able to find all the ways to make it creative and interesting. And because, yeah, you could still go to one bar, but I was like, no, I can go everywhere. Yeah. And what, what are you yourself and your, and your business focused on right now? Well, this slow season. So for all bartending between, okay, December is still slow, but you still have your New Year's, right? You still have your holiday parties. Um, but the second January and February come, comes around until it's um, a playoffs. And, you know, <laughs> before all the sports events, there's nothing going on. And a lot of us use our savings, honestly, to get through because it's so slow because uh, it's the winter. Um, but hopefully next year, we're going to get into more corporate events. We definitely have been doing it. Mm. Uh, weddings. I want to get a little more extensive into it. Uh, larger ones. And I did, uh, I actually did the MLB week. Uh, I was doing the tents and I was working with the city. So the city and now you're actually working to do a little more, uh, maybe getting some more public spots out there with tents. And um, we were talking about doing the ice skating rink one decided to pass on it, but, um, next year there might be some more community uh, outreaches and, and parties and just kind of getting little city nooks back together again. And what's your future vision for your company? Ooh, uh, I would like to expand it to a few more States. I think I am in the Pacific Northwest, so I can still send employees to like Portland or Coeur d'Alene. So I get out, we get out there. I do actually a fair amount of Portland events, um, but I would like to get a little farther. I'd love to Hawaii. I'm looking in. I actually am. I'm looking at Hawaii. Uh, that would be great to do during the slow season. And if I really can, then I would kind of personally would like to be more of the, like a celebrity bartender. So the yacht side is looking pretty good. And again, there's always yacht season. So yacht season, there's, there's like two yacht seasons and it, if I can fill in the gaps for winter for yacht season, it's just so much fun. It, you know, you're on a boat and when you have your days off, they're amazing. You're like on vacation and the, yeah, the people want a lot, but they pay a lot. So you just do it and the money's great. And you're never, again, never bored. I think that's where it just comes down to is I always want to feel like I'm either educate, getting educated with something or entertained with, with something else or the creativity part. So it's usually one of those three or all of them. Natasha, talk about the pros and cons of having your own business. <laughs> oh my gosh, paperwork. Um, yeah, you got to make sure you're on point. It, it's, it's not easy. You have to do your own, um, your, your own work to try to find everything. I really do hope I could get a little larger where I can like afford a true accountant who I can just send everything off to. Uh, otherwise, because I hate sitting at a computer, which is again, why I never had an office job. So I have to revert to that point a little bit and be on a computer. Um, again, I'm an in-person per like person. So if I do have to do something via email, instead of talking on the phone or seeing someone in person, it can be a little more challenging, at least for me. Uh, and then some people want answers really fast. They're used to these large companies that never sleep, right? So everyone cannot be Amazon. Oh, exactly. Everyone cannot be Amazon. Yes, I'll, I know, joke. So my, my business card has been floating around. I will get text message at 11 o'clock at night. And then they'll be like, no joke, an hour later, question mark, because I didn't get back to them. I'm, I'm shutting my, my business off. Okay, maybe at 6 p.m., 7 p.m. But if you're if you're texting me at after 9 p.m. and expecting an answer, I, I can't do it. I'm only human. And and then I think the other hardest part is a lot of my events are on Saturdays. And that's when everyone first gets their day off. So Saturdays are my busiest day. I have no life on Saturdays, any Saturday. So I have to do emails in the morning right when I get up. And then I usually have one to three events to prep for. So between those two things, or really four things, um, I, I can't breathe. I have no time. So how do you do your schedule? I'm, I'm guessing I'll take you take, take, take a couple of days off. Yeah. Week. Yeah. Um, so I have the, a really good bartender's week or weekend, I should say. So it's great when you can be a bartender from Wednesday to Saturday or Tuesday to Saturday and then have Sunday, Monday or Sunday, Monday, Tuesday off. That's kind of like the ideal schedule. Um, 
my Sunday events are 50, 50. So my Sundays are here and there. And then Mondays, I'm always, always off. Tuesdays, usually off. And then I go back to the grind. People don't realize how great it is. Like do errands and stuff during the week, right? Yes. No one's there. Of course, Costco's always busy. But most of the places, like there's no one there, right? Mm -hmm. It's way better than doing something on Saturday, right? And a lot of like when you're going out and enjoying yourself, one, it's not going to be busy because you're, let's say you're on a Sunday night or Monday night, Monday night. It's, Monday night is typically industry night because that's when most of them are off. And then, so when you do go out somewhere, that's when you find everyone you know. You go to that bar where everyone else is off and you're not getting any, I don't, we, okay, we call it amateur hour sometimes when you get some drinkers that are new and you, you don't see any of that on Mondays. You see that on the weekends. Yeah. So, and no, no crowds. It's easy. So Natasha, is there something I should ask you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Not that I can think of. I am having a great time. <laughs> cool. All right. So um, you gave a lot of value. Can you give us any last minute advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Uh, take care of you. You are number one. I understand trying to keep the peace or, you know, trying to help people make people happy. Um, but once you can, you try to allot your time to do that, but make sure you give time for yourself. Um, your mental stability is super important. I have definitely worked myself many, many hours where I should have had a breakdown. I really should have. And somehow I just figured it out, took some time off. Um, do what makes you happy. I, I know a lot of people are like, oh, I hate hearing the saying, oh, we'll find a job that doesn't feel like work. Um, I kind of did find that though. And I, I know it's out there for a lot of people. And of course, again, like I was saying, you, I still have to do computer work. I have to do things I don't like to do, but in the end and long run, it's, it's, it's enriching to my, my life in a sense. And as a very, again, a very social person, I, I like to keep that. And as growing older, I, I don't ever want to lose that because I see how some people, when they shut, shut off and away from the community, they just kind of get in their little hole. And so I think it is get over your, go get over that hump or that challenge of what you're, you're comfortable in. And once you get over it, you feel freer. And I think that's kind of the roundabout to it and find whatever you're doing. Of course you have to survive, but find a place and a path that can still make you happy. And it's not going to come easy. It's not going to come fast. And I know there's people older than me that this has happened to. Um, and that, you know, I, I'm 40. I took a long time to find this and I'm still, I know, still know I have a long way to go to get somewhere where I feel that, that my business is a working organism, I guess. And I don't have to be the only one really in charge. Thanks, Senator Tasha. Thank you. So can you give us your social media so people reach out yes. to you? Yes. <laughs> so Instagram's the best way. And it's PNW, just like PN, like Pacific Northwest, dot bar dot events. Like suppose someone wants to like do business with you. Yeah. Just go to Instagram or how's that work? Um, the, other, the other one would be the website okay. and you can get my email or get an estimate. And it's just pnwbar.com. So it's super easy. So yeah. how do you decide how to work with someone? Is this based on money or like? Uh, it's really who can get me first. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I have a few employees as well. So typically I can do up to three events, depending on how large they are, uh, up, up to 10 employees. And it also depends on like how much time we have. So yeah. if you tell me three months ahead compared to two weeks ahead, oh, yeah, way better, you know, way better, yeah. yeah, if it's last minute, sometimes I just can't staff it. Mm. Um, and if you want me personally, of course, that's a whole nother thing. So <laughs> boom, 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 boom. I want some motherfucking money. I'll the graph. <laughs> but again, like it's been so fun. People again have either requested me over and over again, or they're they're friends and they're friends, and so you you just get this community and repeat people, and you, yeah, it's a party, but yes, I'm still responsible. Yeah, it's just it's a nice it's like, balance. It's a good mix, right? Exactly. Got to be yeah. personable. We can't drink. It'd be yeah. Good time. Yeah. Exactly. And this hustle. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you having me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. Thank you. Cheers.